Hello, hello! Are we live? Welcome, everybody, to Debate Direct episode 56. This is the first Debate Direct of 2022. Um, and, you know, obviously, we've just recently hit uh, a big milestone. I'm going to turn the music down just a bit. Hopefully, it's not too loud, too quiet. I'm not sure, because the music isn't the only audio you're going to be hearing in addition to my voice, guys. Also, like, can we just talk about the fact that Aria Math came on? That is, like, one of the most nostalgic songs in existence. This is, like the most nostalgic Minecraft song to me. That's crazy. But anyways, today I am joined by a very special guest to, you know, analyze, evaluate, and review the Fazbear Frights books. We're doing some tier lists, all right? May I introduce the one, the only, <laughs> Ambience. Welcome to the stream. Hey, thanks. Alright, that was weird. I was watching the stream and then uh, you like unmuted at the same time, so I heard like both audio. Oh like, man, I get it. Yeah, if only the latency was perfect, but no, it, it is yeah. what it is. But yeah, um, double me. Can you guys hear him alright? Is the audio balance good? Because I don't want the music to be too loud. Hello, hello. Audio balance good? I think if I turn the music down just slightly, that should be alright. But yeah, guys, it's ambient. So, for those of you who don't know, this is finally our first collab on my channel. I have actually featured on his channel already. And the first collaboration I've done with, you know, relatively speaking, a big YouTuber. This is kind of a big deal for me. Because I've always collaborated with people who have, like, a smaller presence than me. But, uh, look at that. Ambience's sub count is so high it doesn't display to the last decimal. But anyways, no, this is seriously, guys, you go check him out, he does some really cool videos. Basically, the guy to go to for FNAF content and, you know, getting good at uh, the games. But uh, the club that I was actually in was the uh, predictions for Security Breach. I was slated for the lore predictions, and then I filled in for Ethan with the gameplay predictions as well. And, yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you should yeah, absolutely was... go check him out on his Discord server. That, that was definitely, uh, that was definitely one thing I actually want to do is like maybe look back at those sometimes, uh, just like in our spare time and call and like see what we got right, what we got wrong, all that. I yeah. think that'd be real interesting. If you ever want to do more collabs on either channel, hit me up, dude. Like, there's plenty we could do. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, catch up with like chat as well. Hello, Insta, DJ, Darklink. Nice to see you all. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Um, yes. Ambience in chat as well. And Ethan, hello. Scott can be heard just fine. Audio balance is good. <laughs> okay, let's get into this. Hello, Nintai M. What do you guys think of Fazgoo? Launching right into it. We'll talk more about it as we go, but uh Very weird. Very weird is all I have to say on that. Um, Definitely a very strange one. This is gonna be a topic mm, once we get to uh both stories yeah. that it's featured in, I think. The way this is gonna work is gonna be like a lot of previous Debate Direct episodes that I've done, guys. Again, I have a whole playlist of these if you wanna check them out. This series has become the longest running thing on the channel, um, and I was a fool for not seeing that, but uh, I'm just here to enjoy the ride, really. I mean, yeah, if you go to the playlist, I've done tons of tier lists before, and more recently, because I love tier lists. They, they've actually, like, I know they're a bit of a meme, but I and ironically think they're such a great way of communicating in a relatively simplified way, which you can elaborate on, you know, to make it more accurate, like, just like opinions on stuff, uh, and all kinds of discussions, and again, if we go to the description, I'll read it out for you, it's finally time. Throughout 2020 and 2021, a new FNAF book series of Goosebumps style short stories, Fazbear Frights, released, and have cemented their place with some of the best stories, characters, and even lore hints in the entire Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. But how good were they really? How do the stories compare in writing, and what made good for horror? Join me and my friend, Singular, today as I rank each and every Fazbear Fright story based on how much I enjoyed the plot and characters and its raw lore relevance. I should probably um, preface this, guys, with the fact that everything here is just my opinion. Uh, we may disagree, and that is completely fine, because honestly, um, I'm actually a bit rusty with my memory. Uh, I've read through all the stories once. I haven't yet read volume 12, and with... Um, I've been rereading some of them and making notes as I go for the lore because I'm a theorist. I'm a loser like that. I did English comprehension with FNAF stories, uh, but I'm only up to the man in room 1280. <clears throat> um, so like, I actually watched Dorco's video on Blackbird to refresh myself from that because like my memory of volume six, seven and eight is like super rusty because I haven't read them in ages, but I think I've refreshed myself and everything I need to know. Um, 
And yeah, I'm at, this is going to be a little bit complicated, but what I want to do is make three tier lists today, okay? We're going to do a tier list for the main stories, a separate one for the epilogues, because I feel like the epilogues are kind of... You can't really compare them exactly. And I want to do an alignment chart. Uh, where is that? Here it is. I want to do an alignment chart. Um... <clears throat> where I not just compare good writing and bad writing, which is going to match the tier list, um, but I'm also going to kind of put in um, what I'm going to call law relevance, uh, because this has no impact on the quality of the story, at least it shouldn't, uh, but as someone who's a theorist, has been invested in the mysteries of FNAF and kind of understanding what was really going on for a while, <laughs> to, to put it mildly, uh, I think it would be interesting to see which stories actually have lots of like hints and clues and ties back to other content and stuff that just kind of isn't even recognizably Five Nights at Freddy's because there was a lot of that and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, let's just start. So, Ambience, you can start if you want. I might actually edit this slightly. They've got S, A, B, C, D tiers. I might actually add um, some rows below. If we go E, F, and then an extra one for stories I haven't read. Like, I'm going to have, like, an NA one for the Volume 12 stories, because I, I haven't read those. I know nothing about them. And they were scrapped anyway, so, like, do they even count? You know? Uh, but, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Like, I know that there are summaries <clears throat> of the Volume 12 stories, like, lying around somewhere. We could figure out mm. what they're about if we wanted to, but yes. we kind of want to experience them for the first time when the book actually releases. I've already heard uh, the premise, kind of like the blurb on the back, so like Felix the Shark yeah. is about like a aquatic animatronic, which is really mm -hmm. funky. Uh, the scoop, I can't remember what the scoop was about. It was really uh, meta. It's like, this really, it's like this really meta thing, like where FNAF exists in universe, basically as a game series. It's really weird. I'm curious to see yeah. how they make that work. Yeah. And then you're the band has to do with like a Freddy Fazbear mask that's like actually freddy or, or something i don't, I don't really know but yeah anyways um i don't know if it's just you guys but the music's still really loud for me i'm gonna do a quick audio test uh this will just take us a moment so i'm gonna deafen all right quick audio test animatronic which is and then an extra one one i'm gonna I'm gonna have like an NA one for the scrapped anyway. So. That makes sense. Like I know that there are summaries <laughs> of the volume told some for the. I can't remember what the thing that worked. Yeah. I have five nights. We'll talk more about it. As for security breach, I was double me. Can you guys hear him? Right, is he all to the stream? Hey, thanks. All right. All right, all folks, right. we're all awesome. good. I'm just making sure because like. Sometimes I gotta see myself. I just need to turn that up slightly. Anyways, right, let's get into this. So, there's a lot of Fazbear Fright stories. We're just gonna run through them in the order they were released because there's literally 33 plus the epilogue, so 34 stories. It's kind of crazy. I'll try and keep up with chat. Let's just get into it. So, what did we think of Into the Pit? And chat, feel free to offer your own opinion, make your own tillis as well. The link's in the description, you can use it. What did we think of Into the Pit? So, Into the Pit, I don't think it's, like, either of the stories, uh, for either of us, I don't think it's one of the stories that, like, we'd consider one of the absolute best, but I think it's one that we both have quite a bit of respect for, because it's mm. the Fazbear Fright story, essentially. Yeah. Like, when someone thinks Fazbear Frights that hasn't read the books, this is probably the story that they think of. It's, like, the symbolic yes. story. It's symbolic. It's the first on the cover. It's the very first story. I should also say, guys, um, I would assume this is obvious, but there are obviously going to be spoilers. If for whatever reason you do not want Fazbear Fright spoiled for yourself, please go read the books first. We're going to be talking, like, big spoilers. Everything. Alright? I don't yeah. know. But, uh, yeah. Into the Pit. Uh, yeah. Personally, I'm thinking maybe A or B. Like, this story, um... I remember when MatPat did his first video on Frights, he, he did mention how they spent a lot of time uh, developing the main character, Oswald. He had this whole theory that that was important because he was connected to FNAF VR. But regardless of that... I, I don't know. I thought I thought it was good. It was like his FNAF, uh, but in a different style. It's got all of like the original kind of like hallmarks and tropes. You've got you know, uh, you know, a killer in a rabbit suit. You've got the missing children's incident. Um, again, time travel is absolutely something that doesn't kind of fit in the frame of FNAF. But I, I think the way it was done, looking at closely at the details, it, it's not obviously real time travel. It's more like a kind of. Um, 
being transported to a different world based on memories, maybe all in your head kind of thing, which is very FNAF. Uh, like, that goes back yeah. to FNAF 3. Um, yeah, like, when the story first released, there were a lot of people who uh, very much thought that, like, huh, this isn't FNAF. Like, this is uh, way out there, like, kind of absurd. But looking back at it now, after all that we know about the epilogues and some <laughs> of the other stories, I'd say that this is yeah. one of the stories that is the most connected to FNAF. Um, it's more grounded. Overall, yeah, most well grounded, which is really surprising because it really didn't look <laughs> like that. Uh, right? The start, the whole we had thing. no idea what we were getting into, and we'll get into it. But yeah, no, Into the Pit was super important. Honestly, I like Oswald as a character. I know he's just a kid, but for a kid, I think he's decently developed. I thought it was really strange, but in a good way, and I like. Um, I don't know, like, I I'm gonna give it a B, I think, like, it wasn't insane, it didn't do anything crazy, I mean, it was a bit crazy, but, like, I just think it was a good story, good characters, could kind of, like, plot, you know, the pacing was fine, it was on the longer side, uh, but I think that was, you know, fitting, and, um, again, my criteria for this, guys, is basically writing, so plot, characters, but I'm also gonna factor horror into that, because they are supposed to be scary, they are supposed to be horror stories, and I think... Again, it's just my opinion, but I have uh, certain ideas of how horror should be done in the same way I have, think there's certain ways to do sci-fi and fantasy and whatever correctly, like, you know, effectively. And I think this was good. Like, it wasn't, you know, needlessly scary. It just kind of, like, uh, you know, it, it built up tension at a proper pace and it had, a, like, you know, a decent reason for everything. It was quite mysterious. I'll give it a B. I'll give it a B. To be I think beautiful. It's a, yeah, I think it's a solid B for sure. Um, mm. Well-developed main protagonist. Uh, one of the most FNAF stories, even though it seems kind of absurd out of context. Uh, yeah. Pacing yeah. is fine. I think... Overall, just a solid story, a um, little bit above average, and basically everything. Hey guys, hello Livy, I see you, uh, young. Some of you, Shocker's never read the books? Well, welcome, Shocker Springtrap, there's loads of people here. I, I, I know that there are going to be tons of people from Shrine of Ambience, so welcome guys. If you're enjoying the stream, leave a like, subscribe. Um, <clears throat> just catch up with Shocker as well, there's so much going on. Um, yeah, I'm glad you guys agree, good introduction, you know. Good sense of horror, pacing's alright, yeah man. Pin the link to the website, you're not sure actually. Let me actually put the uh, tier list in chat and I'll pin it. There we go. Uh, yeah, it's make a good idea. your own tier list. I love the new features that YouTube live chat's been getting lately. It's been really helpful, honestly. So yeah, yeah there we go. But yeah, also like Eleanor, yep, yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Eleanor is something else. Um, but yeah, to be beautiful, speaking of. Speak of the devil, and she will appear. Um, I'd probably rank this around the same as Into the Pit. I've got to think about this. To be yeah, beautiful... This is, uh, hmm. this is a story I kind of have to think about, because I have mixed feelings on this. Like, on one hand, I think it's a very scary story. It's really interesting. But, for whatever reason, I have a hard time taking it seriously after learning of all of Eleanor's involvement in the plot. Like, with some of the later stories and the epilogues and things like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, it's just, it doesn't carry, like, the same weight that it once did when I first read it. I think it's, overall, like, it's not a bad story by any means, but I still tend to lean toward the end of it being better. Yeah, again, there's, like... A lot of other factors at play here, guys. Like, do we take into consideration the story in isolation or in the context of frights after finishing it or in the context of frights up to that point? Because things like To Be Beautiful, you know, Epilogue 2, um, Fetch, completely change uh, when you've read stuff that comes on later. When you're rereading it, it's a bit different because you're aware of other things connecting, like, the threaded narrative of, you know, the Stitch Wraith and all that kind of thing. Um, so again, yeah, um, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like we should just kind of leave everything on the table, basically, and just kind of take everything into account. Because uh, yeah. that's kind of what we just did with Into the Pit, right? Like, it might have been ranked a bit lower if it was, uh, you know, like, more absurd, non-FNAF, uh, yeah. like, had actual time travel like we thought at the time, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna do that. So again, guys, like, my opinion on this not only will change with time as I reread the later ones, but might change depending on, are we talking about the story in its own? We're gonna go in context, because I think the whole point of Frights is that it's like this connected series of, you know, uh, short stories. The epilogues, are, you know, thrown a lot of things together. Yeah. I'm gonna just put To Be Beautiful... Like right there, yeah, I'm gonna put it in B, just because I still think, um, I think it was Sarah, the protagonist. 
I think mm -hmm. the, the, the her conflict was still just as well written as Oswald's. Like, you know, it's kind of childish, but obviously, you know, they're young characters. And I like, again, the the pacing and the kind of, you know, how their mindset changes as the story goes on. For both of those protagonists, I like them. Uh, you know, I felt like I was, you know, with them for this story. I do agree. Mm -hmm. With what Amit's saying, the story wasn't crazy, but it, it was also very fanaffy, you know. It obviously started the whole trend of body snatching, which is what this whole thing just keeps doing. But also, it was kind of grounded in, like, sister location, because, um, you know, we, uh, you know, Elena, Eleanor was just another version of Circus Baby. And there's also novel times with the kind of illusion disc, similar, like, heart, what are they called, the keychain thing? It's kind of similar. Um... And it like it leans on the technological side rather than the paranormal, um, which I think works for early frights because this series went way more into the paranormal than like the games did. Uh, but earlier on, like it was more obviously connected to the games. I don't know. I think it's like a good story for a FNAF fan. Um, yeah, I yeah, don't know. I, I'm gonna I leave feel it like be. You're right. It, it's not as grounded in FNAF as a lot of other stories. There's definitely some uh, issues that I have with it, but I think overall it's not a bad story. Uh, yeah. Sarah is actually uh, just as well, like just as well written of a protagonist as Oswald is for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is the first story that really has the protagonist uh, meet some kind of brutal downfall, essentially. Mm. And yeah. it really, because, you know, like, Oswald survived the events of Into the Pit, but you actually feel really bad for Sarah at the end of that story, so. Yeah. I was originally, like, like going to say it'd be about C, but I feel like this is a low B, like, below Into the Pit. I feel like I might move them, guys. I'm not sure. Again, it depends what the scale is here. We'll work it out as we go. Like, with, um... Yeah. Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, man, I forgot. It's like... Yeah, I don't know. I'm... Let me just catch up with chat. You put in D tier, C, fair enough, guys, fair enough. Eleanor is a creep from hell, yeah. I didn't like To Be Beautiful, that's fair enough. We're gonna get on to count the ways, yeah. Mm. Man, we've got so many messages in chat. I'll talk about the stories when I get up to them, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, let's just keep going, no waste any time. Count the ways. Right. Count the ways. I need to think about this one, because I'm re remembering the story. Um, yeah, th this is another thing that, like, I need to form uh, a bit more of oh, yeah. on how it's going to be beautiful. I remember what I, I was going to say. So, something which I noticed was a trend in the first three volumes of Fazbear Frights, which I thought was going to be a thing throughout the whole series, which might have been limiting, but might have also been pretty cool, was that every volume had three stories. One with a good ending, one with a bad ending, and one with an ambiguous or neutral ending. Uh, but then I we just started, notice. kept getting bad endings, like, volume 4 or 5 onwards. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Into the Pit was a good ending. You know, Oswald saves his dad, he gets out of the pit, you know, the creature is killed, it's hanged from the netting, and like, you know, he got out safe. To Be Beautiful is obviously a bad ending, it's like Sister Location. The character, well, I mean, it's not exactly like Sister Location, but you know, the main character dies a, you know, horrific death. Um, and, you know, the, the villain, the antagonist, wins. They get utterly tricked. It's just awful. Uh, Count the Ways was brilliant, in my opinion, because it had this ambiguous ending, and I loved the ambiguity of the ending. Now, I will say I didn't like Millie that much as a protagonist. It was a bit harder for me to pity her because she was a lot less likable. I mean, she was a goth girl. <laughs> so, you know, points down for that, maybe. Um, but you know, I love that Funtime Freddy got his own story, very iconic character, although I have to say, when I read this the first time, until it mentions, like, pink and white later on, I thought it was FNAF 1 Freddy, because I didn't recognise, like, I can't imagine Kel and Goff, uh, with this characterization of Freddy, but it is supposed to be, like, the Funtime version, maybe, like, prototype Funtime Freddy, because there's no mention of Bonbon, I can imagine, like, there's a whole different, like, model and stuff, there's a SFM yeah. model where, like, the Bonbon -bon part's just torn off. But I like the premise yeah, that, like, is... sorry, uh, I was just gonna say, I like uh, the premise that her granddad has, like, collected stuff in his, like, shed, and it's like, he's found this in, like, you know, some landfill, and it's like, she gets stuck inside it, and it's, uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, yeah, um, so I do feel like this is a different version of Funtime Freddy, uh, compared to what we see from the games, um, but... Yeah, I, like, looking back on the story, I actually really like it. I think its only downfall is that, like you said, Millie could have been more likable as a protagonist. I feel like this could have been a lot scarier and a lot more dramatic if, uh, like, I cared about the outcome of Millie as much as I did Oswald or Sarah or, like, a few of the other protagonists. 
Mm. I feel like yeah. that's its only big downfall. Um, I like this version of Funtime Freddy. I think it's interesting to see like a darker spin on his uh, classic persona a little bit. Mm. And yeah. um, the whole thing of like the, the life and death being like uh, constantly throughout the entire story, I actually do yes. quite like it. It reminded me of like Unis Honest a bit of all things. Which is yeah, really, really. Wow. Um, yeah. But uh, you know what? Yeah, I, I kind of like the theme. I actually, uh, I, I, like, I, I don't want to be like Dorco, who's just like, you know, way too generous, everything goes in the S rank, but like, I really do like this story, I think I'm gonna put them all in B for now, I'm really not sure, because I didn't like Millie as much, but I love the structure of the story, I remember now, it's like flashing back from past to present, past to present, with Millie inside the belly of the beast, and we learn slowly bits more about, you know, how his eyes can roll inside, and like, you know, there's loads of these different ways he can kill her, and it's like, you know... Millie, well, what did I do to deserve this? You walked into the belly of the beast, and it's like, she has to not only confront the literal demon of the, the monster who's bored enough to, you know, you know, fantasize about how to kill her and then get on with it in all these ways, but also, you know, um, like her own, you know, mistakes as an individual for, like, you know, pushing away everyone in her life. Uh, I love her grandfather, like, or whoever he is, I forget the character's name, it's like, he was such a wholesome and, like, fatherly figure. Um, and I, like, I felt, I, I, f the, the person I feel the most bad for is him, if Millie dies. Um, and we'll come back to that, actually. But yeah, I, lo I love the ambiguity of how it could go either way, and you're really not sure. It definitely could have been more tense and dramatic and dark. It felt a bit light. I'm gonna put it in a C. I think it's like a, I think it's like an average FNAF story. It's got, you know, a good bit of, you know, fan service, you know, oh, it's Funtime Freddy, even since location. Got a bit of, you know, um... Again, it's character focused, uh, and I think I think that's good for short stories um, because you don't need to spend ages developing your character, making them complex. You can just set them out with a few traits and just let that play itself out with the plot. I don't know. I'm not a writer. I've studied English literature, but I'm not a writer. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna spend too long. That's everything I gotta say. Okay. Now, I, yeah, I could I could push for this being above to be beautiful. I think um, because mm, there's a lot of things I do like about enough. it, like you were saying, the past and present structure, the um, like just everything leading up to it, basically uh, the amb the first ambiguous ending, and the fact that um, again, like a uh, bit of a spoiler, but we said this before the stream started, uh, or like right as the stream was starting. Uh, yeah. The fact that essentially the reward almost for getting through the entire series is finding out the ending of Count the Ways. It no longer becomes an ambiguous ending, but it yeah. stays that way for a long time. It does. So, um, I, I nope. really like yeah. it. Um, yeah, I could push, like, I feel like I could definitely see this being around the same uh, caliper as Into the Pit, but it does have certain downfalls. The protagonist isn't quite as well written, uh, just in general. Uh, so I would say it, it definitely could be like a high C tier, I think. Yeah. Again, Volume 1 seems pretty consistent to me. These could all feasibly be like in the same low B, high C kind of tier. Um, and yeah, guys, the epilogues, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at the end because the epilogues are kind of a separate thing. You can't really rank them the same, you know, as the uh, short stories because it's one short story in 11 parts. They're much shorter. Uh, the whole kind of like writing style and structure is different as well. I'm going to give them their own tier list uh, And we're going to do that after we're done with uh, You know volume 11. So with that in mind, I'm just going to go to my uh, Chart now and update these so again uh, For my alignment chart again, the ranking is pretty much the same. They're all around the same level I'm going to put into the pit at the top maybe to be beautiful for count the ways around the same but law relevance uh, it's just interesting to point out, you know, Into the Pit was obviously, um, kind of shit, saying, okay, so, it's in 1985, there's six victims, this is an alternate universe, it's, you know, its own kind of continuity, you know, different to the games, um, and it's a bit more experimental, it's kind of cool, it's nothing huge, but I'll put it there, um, To Be Beautiful had some sister location tie-ins, about the same, and Count the Ways was a very basic, it was like, yeah, Fun Time Freddy, you know, child capturing stomach thing, yeah, a little bit of lore relevance. Nothing major, but that's probably where I put it. Volume 2, here we come. Uh, what do you think of Fetch? It's going to be chat as so, well. We've had, we've had quite a bit of discussion about this story uh, in the past, like when I did my own tier list. Um, this is definitely a very interesting story because I feel like it can work well as either a standalone story or something within the greater canon. 
Yeah. Um, I do think it's quite well written. I like the protagonist, definitely more. Uh, Greg, Nelly, I think like, his name was. Yeah, 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 like around the same level as Oswald or Sarah, probably. Um, I like Fetch I so. as a character, as an antagonist, also. Um, mm, I feel awesome. like the entire story, like the pacing and everything, it's overall, I think, pretty well written. Uh, I like the intense pace of it, as opposed to some of the slower paces of the previous stories in Volume 1. And I think, yeah. like, the stakes actually felt really high throughout the entirety of it, basically. It felt really intense and uh, really agree. exciting. So, I, I could definitely, like, see this being an eighth tier. I feel like this is better than any of the Volume 1 stories, just because the pacing is good, the characters are good, uh, it always feels intense, it has ties back into, uh, more stuff in Fazbear Frights, and it does feel like a FNAF story overall, I think. Fetch feels I like agree. a character that could easily belong in the FNAF games. Yeah. So, I do, Just, I do feel uh, like this is actually pretty good. Like, I've always yeah. ranked it a bit lower than other people do. People tend to rank this one really high, but I can Fair. definitely see why, because it's just all around a very solid story. Um, just catch up with chat. I see everything you're saying, Insta. I like how you're summing up all the stories. It's really cool, and like the lore connections. There definitely is a, a surprising amount in some of them. Uh, not as much in others, though. And uh, yeah. Guys, I'm sorry if I can't read every message. There's quite a lot now, but uh, thank you so much for joining. I do see everything, and I do acknowledge everything. Um, we'll talk about it when we get there. Right, I, I love the epilogues, we'll talk about them, but yeah, hello meme guy, thanks for joining, Sparky Cannon, lol, yeah, so this is what I want to talk about, fetch for me, <sighs> you see, I don't want to like, overrate a story and be that guy, but I might honestly give this S rank, uh, because I just think it's pretty much the perfect Fazbear Fright story, uh, there's obviously nitpicks, but the way I see it is this, likeable protagonist, Greg, uh, I think his name's Greg, is like, He's very flawed as an individual, but he's not obnoxious. You can understand his motivations and his kind of interest in this, like, weird pseudoscience, um, you know, in the, like, story. Uh, but also, you know, he has his friends. I forget their names, but it's all, like, you know, the, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, outcasted kid stereotypes. You've got, like, the tall, thin one, the short, fat one. The, you know, I forget their names, but I love how, you know, they're like urban explorers and, you know, they have like, you know, these like very like, you know, their relationships feel real. They don't feel artificial, even, you know, they, they feel like you actually, they've actually known each other for a while. And Greg has lots of people in his life that he cares and loves about. He's got his friends, he's got his family, he has like an uncle who loses his thumb, which we'll get into. And uh, he's like mom. And yeah, there's, you know, characters are great. Uh, I felt tense the whole way through as well, because Fetch was honestly so threatening. The whole concept of him, and not just Fetch doing awful things, but doing awful things because of, you know, Greg's thoughts and actions, and those being misinterpreted in a more twisted way. That's really scary, because then Greg has this immense guilt over everything that goes wrong, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, um, yeah, Fetch was super intimidating. Uh, and obviously, as a FNAF fan, the amount of lore packed into this was kind of insane. We've got a full-on, like, callback to the Five Nights at Freddy's 3 minigames with this, uh, location that's got, like, open ceilings, there's rain coming in, and it's, like, super rotted down. It's, you know, in, in the games, that was supposed to be the FNAF on location here. It's a thing by the Seaside, which some people have speculated that Fazbear Frights might be, because, uh, Seaside, like, horror attractions, uh, are popular in places where people have an accent, like phone dude. That was some weird theory I read a while ago, but like the actual um, the thing that really interested me second time reading this after getting over the you know the tension, the sheer tension of uh, how the plot progresses, was the kind of science because this story alone is the only thing I can really say outside of a couple of the epilogues, which pretty much actually attempts to explain everything. And I mean everything, because, um, you know, it wasn't until Sister Location and, like, Peter Sim in, in the novels we introduced, like, Remnant and this idea that, like, there's a natural scientific logic to how, you know, hauntings happen and ghosts, you know, you know, haunt machines and why the animatronics are possessed. But this story just takes it to, like, a whole new level. Um, you, we hear about, you know, emotional energy, kind of. That's more elaborated on in Epilogue 3, but we get, like, the zero point field and, um, Oh, I forget what they call them, like, the machines, and, like, how thoughts and, like, uh, intentions can, like, manipulate reality if they're, like, focused enough, and it's, like, I haven't quite worked it all out, and it might, you know, 
might be overanalyzing something, but like that was fascinating to me because like, like if there's yeah, if, there's, if, if, if there's something to be taken out of that, like the whole franchise might hinge on like how that works, which would be crazy. Because I just think yeah. it's interesting to actually understand like the the, the logic. But yeah, uh, the only issue I really have with this story is the ending. It felt a bit abrupt. It wasn't really as like it wasn't. Um, it was just it just kind of happened. It's like the story just stopped. Um, you know. I kind of get what you mean. Yeah, it felt like that's it the only problem I have with it. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it needed to go on a bit longer and have a bit of either a clearer ending or um, I don't know, just more resolution for Greg. Because it's like, what happens after that? Like, I think it would have been nice, well, not nice for Greg, if it was, you know, it ended with him, like, being, like, arrested for suspected murder of, uh, I forget what the girl's name is, uh, who's, uh, like, Kimberly, body. Kimberly, I think. Kimberly, that was it. I think it's Kimberly's body at the end in, like, um, like, the, the bathroom, because, like, yeah, the last is. one was, like, he was thinking about Kimberly, he's like, wait, Fetch is gonna go get her. Um, mm -hmm. And he gets told off for rushing to our house. So they're hiding in the bushes. They think he's some kind of creep. And it's like, he thinks, okay, it's nothing to worry about. And then, boom. But, like, we don't see the consequences of that and how that goes on. So, yeah. It's still an S rank, in my opinion. I'll stop going on about it, but I love Fetch. It's probably one of my favorite stories. Again, we will we will see. We will see. Uh, Lonely yeah, Freddy. I think you've actually, I think you've actually convinced me hmm. that this uh, is S tier for now. It might like, be overrated, but I think it is S tier. I think it's like Revenge of the Sith. You know, it, it it's I earned think, its place. I think it actually, is. yeah. Um, I think that it even it even though it is sometimes overrated, it really is um a great story. There's a ton to unpack. It's somehow like the entire. Fazbear Frights franchise may hinge on this story. When people typically think of stories like that, they think Into the Pit or To Be Beautiful. Mm. But I feel like Fetch is like just as important, if not more, to how everything works overall. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Like I've, I've really got to say uh, the fact that they somehow managed to combine that with good characters, an intimidating villain, good pacing, like and just all of that, balance all of that at only, once. Yeah, it's yeah. only downfall is the ending. Like, they balance everything so incredibly well, I think it definitely could be S tier. Yeah. And uh, I see your comments, uh, Robert. Uh, I have to agree with you about Millie. Boring protagonist, again. I know she's supposed to be insecure, but I feel like they could have given her more redeeming qualities. I, like, you know... It doesn't help mm -hmm. that I, I personally knew someone like her in, like, middle school, which really put me off. <laughs> that could just be me, though. And, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Just, you know, a really chat, man. Sparky can again as well. Is Fetch like a Sparky reference? Because if so, that's even cooler. I know that's just like a fan like he, service tidbit. I feel but... like he could be. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it might be because again, we've never had a dog character. Um, Reg, that was it. Creeper hacks. Thank you. Yes. It's too way too out there for me. I understand, but honestly, again, it, it depends because like as a FNAF fan, as someone with the context of the previous games, I might view things differently to someone reading the story without being familiar with FNAF, and I completely understand that they won't appreciate these things. This is not really writing quality, but I like that Frights is actually trying to ground uh, the paranormal in the science and kind of give it a kind of a consistent logic. So it's not just, oh, creepy things because, ha, huh, scary. It's like, there's actually a reason. And I like that. I think, I think it's a bit complicated and it's like, you'd need to reread to get your head around. But I, I think it's like a nice optional mystery for the hardcore fans such as myself. But I completely understand your entire your opinion. Will I make? Oh yeah, um, meme guy, uh, you sent me a tier list for animators hell. I can't find it right now. Whatever. You sent me a tier list for animators hell. I'll do that in an animators hell stream. That's not really relevant right now. I'll do it in an animators hell stream. But uh, yeah, if we're all done, we can move on to Lonely Freddy. I'm um, just catching Sounds up with good. chat. Yeah. Again, Greg was kind of relatable as well. Greg is like. All the main character things, doesn't he? He's got so much to lose. Romantic interest, which doesn't feel forced or contrived, you know? Um, his own kind of, like, internal struggle that no one else can relate to. Uh, his own, like, flaws of, I don't know, like, being too, I don't know, curious or whatever. Yeah, anyway. But, uh, yeah, Lonely Freddy was an interesting one. Alec, I remember Alec. I remember this one pretty uh, clearly. Uh, yeah, Fazgu is... Yeah, we'll talk about Fazgu. But yeah, I would probably put Lonely Freddy in a uh, C. This is one of the first ones that jumps out to me. Is kind of, it's not great. It's okay. I put it's not mediocre, but I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's amazing. Um, 
Yeah, I would put this in C or D tier. I feel like it could be um, a D tier because it doesn't have yeah. as much going for it as Count the Ways, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, this basically takes Count the Ways' downfall of having a unlikable protagonist and then kind of takes it to the extreme. Alec is one of the most obnoxious protagonists in the entire series, most likely. Yeah. Uh, really didn't feel bad for him at all. Not even nearly like as much, uh, not even as much mm. as I did Millie, but definitely not really? as much as like Mark wow. or Sarah or yeah. uh, anyone else, really. Um, the antagonist isn't as intimidating as Fetch, but I feel like it is a story that has a very ominous ending. Uh, mm, partly yes. because we never actually see what happens uh, and what the entire point of the Lonely Freddy's is. Like, yeah. it never comes up in the epilogue, so we have no idea why it's there. It just doesn't make any sense. But it's also not something that feels... It feels kind of out there. It makes sense in the FNAF universe, I guess, kind of. But it's a bit more yeah. out there than some of the other stories. I, I will say, like... I didn't hate Alec, but I know what you mean. Like, he's... I, I like when a character is deliberately flawed, and I think Lonely Freddy is basically step closer but worse. We'll talk about that. Um, you know, allegories to FNAF 4 minigames or not. Uh, Alec was kind of just... I, I don't know. May, maybe, again, no redeeming qualities, and it's like... You can, you can understand him, but yeah, I don't, I don't really like him. Um, it was pretty tense. The horror was good. Uh, and I think, like, the, the other characters were okay. Like, some of the children were pretty obnoxious, but I think that was the point. Uh, and the, the series has a lot of that, which is, you know, fair enough. Um, again, th there was a couple of weird things. Like, the conflict over the Yarg Foxy merchandise and, like, how there was, like, just a ticket conveniently in the, like, wind tunnel after Alec had supposedly already got it. There was, like, a second one. Like, lots of things like that felt pretty contrived for plot reasons. And... Although the concept was cool of like Lonely Freddy and like Alec, you know, again, something which comes up again and again and again and again in virtually every story in this like series is karmic justice. It's like, you know, it's not just bad things happening to people for no reason. Sometimes it's like bad things happening to a bad person or a good person who has made some mistakes, you know, as a kind of justice, which is something which is talked about in the new kid, which we'll get to. And also Blackbird. Oh my God. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, it's it, like, sometimes it doesn't hit the mark just because, like, the writing was a bit off, you know, the pacing or whatever. Um, the one thing which this does better than Fetch is that it has an ending which is really nice, perfectly paced, I like how uh, ominous it is. But again, the fact that it's never really addressed, it kind of sucks for anyone who isn't, like, you know, a FNAF fan who knows about, like, sitter location and stuff. But even then, it's like... How exactly does that body snatching work? I mean, you could you could kind of work it out based on the like science of stuff in Fetch, and I I like the eyes changing color, like that was a good detail, but yeah, it was um I don't know, I'm gonna be able to see maybe a D. It was it was okay. It was like passable. It's an average fright story, in my opinion. Yeah, it's passable. It's just not something that like I personally could put above count the ways just because it's kind of got like the same downfalls as Count the Ways with a pretty unlikable protagonist and all that, but it has even more downfalls and not as much going for it. Uh, mm. Just, I think like the Lonely Freddies are about as intimidating as Funtime Freddy. There's not much like uh, bad there with the antagonist, but my biggest, one of my biggest complaints with it, the pacing of the story is very slow. Um, yeah, as Creeper Agreed Hacks, Creeper Hacks. Chat, the only, yep. the only interesting Spot. thing really is the ending. And yeah. it takes a while to get there, and it's really not engaging up to that point. Uh, it feels like a lot of stuff just exists for plot convenience. Um, the ending is the ending is pretty scary, but that's really all I can say it has mm. going for it because the pacing is just so slow. Uh, the protagonist is unlikable. I think it does have quite a few issues for sure. Yeah. The one thing I'm actually going to move this to D. I'm actually going to move this to D. One thing I remember distinctly now is that something which I noticed again throughout the early volumes is that Fazbear Fright seemed to take a specific aspect of FNAF and kind of expand it in a specific way. A lot of the stories are, you know, um, you know, small, old, broken, haunted toy, you know, from the pizzeria chain that closed decades ago, you know, coming to haunt an individual. And it's like a lot of not animatronics so much as small toys, and we'll get into that. But also, Lonely Freddy was the first story actually set in the 80s in an open operating Freddy's establishment. All the previous ones uh, were like in like the present day, like the 21st century, you know, when 
And again, this is something we'll get into. I was actually just writing notes about the Man in Room 1280 earlier today, which I think confirmed this, but it's like, in the Frights universe, Fazbear Entertainment managed to survive by becoming like a toy manufacturing company or something. It's kind of weird. It's not really explained, but it's kind of, you know, you have to assume. But like, it's still there, but it's not like a pizzeria thing, because you know, like, that's a trend that kind of died out in the night after the 90s. I don't really know. But yeah. yeah. Um, next story is Out of Stock. Um, now, personally, I liked Out of Stock, but I think it was, you know, very, uh, very surface level, you know, like, a bunch of kids steal a toy, and the toy turns out to be malicious, it's like, you know, it's very simple, it's nice, good moral lesson for the kids, you know, and, um, it was kind of tense, but it wasn't anything crazy, like, there's a lot of, also, like, kind of pointless scenes <laughs> like they the plush app chaser is like um a plush app but with like you know human eyeballs and teeth it's all like wrong broken it got sent back um and it's like they find out that like holding the flash out and it works but then the flash like conveniently goes out and they get chased to another room and then that just repeats like again um i don't know it it was all right i liked uh, i liked the protagonist they were actually like they were just all right they were definitely better than millie and alec but definitely not an Oswald or a Sarah, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think yeah, it was um, a bit slow to start, but the ending was good. I liked the the train scene. I thought that was a very interesting way for it to play out, and the way that segued into the epilogue was amazing. Hmm. Yeah, I. So I think it. Um, I agree with you that like it's very surface level, very simple, but I actually don't think it hurts the story all that much. So, personally, I have actually never felt this, like, on edge as I have while reading a Fazbear Fright story than really? out of stock. It's the most intense story uh, that I've read, and it is kind of repetitive. Uh, but, like I said, I actually don't think it hurts the story that much, because it feels hmm. really intense the whole way through of uh, just how intimidating the plush trap chaser is, just how fast it is, and the fact that it never stops, essentially. I guess. Is, yeah, yeah. like, uh, a very intimidating villain, like, a very scary setup to me. Um, I would say that it's on the level of fetch, basically, in terms of intensity, and I think the protagonists are written pretty realistically as well. Yeah. I think it's a very yeah. similar story to fetch. The only thing that hurts it, and why, like, I would rank it in about A tier or so, probably, um, is because there's not as many lore, there's, like, basically no lore tie-ins, even to, uh, the own series, Fazbear Frights, aside from the ending, which is the train scene and how that goes into the epilogue. Mm. Um, I think it's set up very well, it's interesting how it manages to be, uh, mm. a very intense and pretty scary story, even though it has a good ending. So, overall, yeah. I think, like, it's actually... It's actually very well written. It just doesn't balance as many things as something like Fetch or Into the Pit does. I agree. It's very yeah. much centered on. It's very much centered on an intense setup, like constantly uh, making the reader feel tense, essentially, uh, yeah, as opposed okay. to trying to balance many things as Fetch or Into the Pit. But overall, I mean, they for what they were going for, I think they did it very well, and it has to be like probably about an A tier for me, maybe high Fair B. Enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I think uh, just for me, it's like the plush app chaser lacked the kind of, you know, uh, meaning, I guess, you know, compared to something like Fetch or uh, Eleanor. I mean, it's not like I'm not saying it had to like speak or anything like that, but it was just kind of there and it was just kind of like chasing them. And it just, I don't know, it just felt a bit like odd. But I, I, I forget the parent's name. I think it's Oscar or something. I like him because mm -hmm. he has this struggle of like always being like this you know really really well behaved child like you know managing in like a difficult like financial situation and like you know upbringing you know like he i think he's like his dad's like left or something and like his mum has to work like two jobs or something and it's like he does one single self indulgent thing and it immediately backfires you know what i'll move this up to a b I, w I don't think I put it in a but i think i can respect that i think i'll give it a b and you know i love plush Trap chaser honestly if there was ever to be a, a Five Nights at Freddy's game, like an actual game, fan game, whatever, you know, maybe with Fazbear Frights characters, which we need more of, man. I, mean, I don't know what happened to Pit Studios. I remember working on that, the Lonely Freddy and the Pit Bonnie game, but, like, it just didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think Plush Trap Chaser would definitely be, like, you know, a good choice to include in that game. Can you imagine, like, a UCN-style game or maybe something like Pizza Sim uh, where you can, like you know, customize, like, having characters. He's got, like, you know, the fetch attraction, the plush trap chaser is, like, you know, 
five dollars. Uh, like yeah, a lot of these, you can imagine, really like as attractions. That'd be cool. Hey. I tell you what, if someone wants to mod uh, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator and change like the animatronics or like attractions, or just to be skins and text one, honestly, to be Fazbear Fights characters, I'll stream that. I'll do it. Maybe Ultimate Custom Night, although I, I've definitely played that game to death, honestly. Um, but yeah. Um, Alp Stock feels like a Michael Bay movie, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I like how he, he's able to, like, gnaw through the doors. Like, this is, like, plush trap at his, like, peak. Like, he's able to, like, yeah. eat through, like, doorknobs. And the flashlight's the only thing that stops him, which is a nice call out to FNAF 4. It was cool. It wasn't lore-heavy, but I don't think that detriments the story. Speaking of, I think it's time to get my lore-relevant chart out. So, again, for this one... Oops. Epilogue... Oh, I guess the epilogue should go on here. Again, we'll talk about the epilogues in a bit. I can't take it off, so I'm just going to put it right in the middle. Uh, fetch, massive lore relevance, honestly, and I liked it, so I'm not gonna put it all the way up there, but it was, it was a good one for me. Lonely Freddy, honestly, not that much lore relevance, like, it was okay. Yeah, Out of I don't stock. feel like there's a lot of lore relevance there. Hmm, Out of Stock just references FNAF 4, it's not like it actually gives us, like, meaning. Uh, but it's like an actual reference and the writing was good, so yeah, I'll put it about there. Again, ignore epilogue one, guys. I can't put it back, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave that there for now. We'll get to the epilogues. Um, okay, I'm just want to catch up with chat because I'm missing messages. But yeah, it's a reference to baby and sister location changing eyes, I guess, because it's like the lonely Freddy is just an AI before, but now they've like swapped. Like now there's a spirit in them, which is obviously Alec. But like, is it doing that because it was programmed to? Is this like an alternative like? you know, remnant capture method, like, I don't know, that whole thing was weird, I love the way it's set up, but I wish it was explained a bit more, again, there's a lot of stories which weren't referenced in the epilogues, which you can assume ended up in, like, you know, the epilogue 5, epilogue 6, kind of, like, you know, pile that the Stitch Wraith collected, but it's like, you never know, and that's for worse with most situations, uh, voice changer, oh yeah, it has a voice changer, I forgot about that, damn, yeah, Out of Stock was like an action-packed one, but that wasn't a bad thing. I love the, the train chicken scene. That was the game of chicken, how he times. That was so cool. Reminds me of the uh, Millions movie. They adapted a novel by, I forget their name, but it's called Millions. Long story. I don't remember it much. But yes. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes. Me watching a Fazbear Frights tier list when I have no idea about their stories. Well, sit and learn or be spoiled because we will be going into it. But uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Just ask Leftery to make it Lamal. Leftery will mod every FNAF game. That'd be cool. You find Oscar relatable? It's awesome. Yeah. Hello, Conan Bren. Thank you for joining. Hello, your boy Dave. Um, man, there's so many people watch today. Let's get on with this. So, 1:35 a.m. Uh, I'm taking a moment to think about this. If you want to go first, Ambience, do it. All right. Um. I really like the story. This is one of my favorites. It's probably my favorite out of the first, like, five volumes. Um, this is psychological horror in the Fazbear Fright series at its peak, I feel like. This is... This is just so well written in terms of psychological horror. Delilah is a very likable protagonist, very well written, very believable, even more so than Oswald or Sarah, I would say. Um, while the She's one of the first adult really protagonists we get. Yeah, first adult protagonist we get in it. A very well done one. Um, mm. But, yeah, I I would say, like, the Yellow Doll isn't a super intimidating villain, but just the entire setup of the story, I feel like, is intimidating. Um, yeah. Especially since we can't really figure out for sure what's going on until it gets much later in the series and we get yeah. to some of the epilogues and figure out, like, Eleanor's involvement and everything. Indeed. Um, which... I don't know. It's up to opinion, I guess, whether that makes it more or less scary, depending on how intimidating you find Eleanor. Um, yeah. But, yeah, overall, I think it's just, uh, for one of the first, probably the first psychological horror story, basically the opposite of out of stock in terms of what it goes for, it's just done incredibly well. Um, great protagonist, intimidating setup, even if the villain isn't so intimidating, and just, like, overall, I think great pacing. Mm, I agree. I'm gonna be bold here. And I'm also going to put it in S rank, because I think uh, Ambience is right. 
Uh, yeah, personally, go. I think the horror and the tension was so good, it wouldn't matter if Eleanor, Ella, sorry, was like a big yellow rubber ducky, okay. And also, I, I like uh, Ella because she's, again, very uh, iconic, instantly recognizable, feels like it's something that actually was built to entertain children or whatever, she's like this multifunction like doll. Um, but also, uh, Ella has a deep connection with uh, Delilah, the protagonist, because she looks like the daughter that Delilah wanted to have with uh, her, like, ex-boyfriend that, like, was never born. Um, yeah. You know, because he broke up with her and cheated on her and stuff. Delilah has, like, a whole backstory, which feels, like, pretty grounded. I also, it was a little bit personal for me because I have had a lot of sleep issues in the past, and, like, being tired all the time was just me in high school, so, like, I was like, yep, this protagonist, uh, like, goddamn, I relate to that, and just, yeah, you, you actually get to see, you know, the normal aspects of her life, her job, you know, her social life, you know, completely juxtaposed by, you know, the the threat and the tension of this Ella doll. It's really sad, but the gradual downfall and the, like, decline of Delilah's sanity is so well executed because it's like, the shift is, like, paced so well that you don't notice it, but once you do, it's like, whoa! Like, how did we get here? And it's like, you gotta reread sections. Uh, I don't know, for me, like, just as good as Fetch, less lore, but a better ending. Uh, because the ending's pretty ambiguous, but, like, you can kind of work out what happens, and it's very scary, and, like, you know. I just, I don't know, I like the characters. I like, uh, she has the friend who's, like, a witch or something, and it's, like, you know, no, who am I thinking? She has the neighbor who's really annoying and always singing, and, like, she has some, like, mystical aspect to it, and then she has the friend who is, like, trying to, you know, to rationalize the whole situation, and it's, like, you know, really sad, because, like, nothing... Nothing, like, really works. I felt really bad for Delilah. Like, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the details now, but, um... Like, yeah, because probably, because yeah, this like ruins her life. Like, it, it, her, her job gets ruined, her friendships get ruined, she eventually just runs off further and further out from both physically and, like, you know, you know, like, culturally, her life, until she's just alone, in the dark, in some strange place, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's a really, it's a really twisted story, like, y you know. But, uh, I yeah, think it was pretty good. I would definitely put it on the level of Fetch. I think it doesn't balance as many things as Fetch does, but it doesn't no. need to, because it does psychological horror yeah. so incredibly well. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more tense at the cost of less lore to better ending. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. It's a good story. Uh, but again, just my opinion. So, Room for One More. This one. I haven't been thinking about this one very much, because the middle story is usually, you know, like the middle child, underrated, uh, forgotten mm -hmm. about. <laughs> I actually quite like this one. Room for One More, honestly, might give a pretty high ranking. I think this, this is the best, like, middle story out of, like, the first five volumes, probably. Mm -hmm. Um... I think it. I think it's cool, like especially for people who have played the yeah, games like. and like uh, recognize early on that this is the sister location building. Yes. Uh, it's pretty like easy to recognize just how much danger Stanley is in from the beginning that he doesn't recognize. Yeah. The the thing that feels weird to me is the dreams of the Funtime animatronics don't feel like they belong in the story. Really, it feels like it kind of yeah. comes out of nowhere and it's just absurd. Mm -hmm. Um. It's another story, it doesn't do psychological horror nearly as well as Room for One More, but it's another story that does psychological horror pretty well. I think everyone's kind of had uh, the fear of something like crawling into their mouth while they're sleeping, basically. Uh, yeah, It's yeah. kind of weird, but it like plays off of a very specific fear, and I think it's, um, like, after you read through it, like, some people, I think, just want to vomit. Like, right. <laughs> it's, uh... Some... It's very disturbing, honestly. Yeah, some a lot of specific fears are, like, really like common phobias though like arachnophobia right specifically being scared of spiders of the dark falling super common i like get vertigo whenever i'm high up and i i've never flown and i'm deadly afraid of it just because it just doesn't feel right to me it's hard to explain it's an irrational thing but like there was a, a news article published years ago which was part of a psychological like social experiment where they claim that every year the average human being will swallow eight spiders in their sleep. Now, obviously, it was completely fake, but people thought it was real and still do for years. Like, this social experiment yeah, is still I working. That. And it's like, that's like a specific phobia that people have now just because someone did this experiment to put like this fake news out there. 
you know, it was, um, I'm pretty sure they did, like, explain it later, and, you know, this was years ago, so fake news wasn't, you know, <laughs> quite what it is these days, um, but yeah, um, that's, uh, that's a story I've heard anyway, I'm not really sure of it, but it's, it's not true, I mean, it could happen, though, you never know, there could be it a spider could, right yeah, above definitely. you on your bed, <laughs> waiting, lurking for the perfect uh... opportunity. Yeah, definitely could happen. Not gonna happen on average. Like, uh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Besides, um, like... Overall, though, <laughs> so yeah, like... Nice to go very creepy story, I think, plays off of a specific phobia. Um, pretty yeah. decent psychological horror. Um, Stanley is... He's not quite on, like, the level of Delilah, but I think he's on the level of, like, Oswald or Sarah as being a pretty, like, yeah. antagonist where you feel bad for him. Again, so, you've got, I, um... I think... You've got an adult protagonist again. And, you know, like, I like how they managed to really rationalize and ground his, like, fear of doctors and stuff so that there was an excuse for the plot to, you know, not have him just get this checked out. You know, the progression of the story, again, it's a slow downward spiral. Um, he wasn't unlikable. He wasn't incredible, but I liked him. I thought he was good. He was a fairly simple man with some issues. Um, there's some nice tie-ins, uh, I think, to previous stories as well. Um... I think the snack space gets mentioned. That might be a different story, but it's like there's a couple things from 135M which are in other stories as well. Uh, but yeah, room for one more, you know, good characters. The plot progression, again, it was kind of like trying to adapt like the actual FNAF game into a different medium. It's like, well, you're just repeating night one, night two, night three, and it's like they they really yeah. emphasize his like psychological like mindset and the process of his like thought process between those just to like really you know amplify them otherwise it would just be like repeating thing right which isn't great for a, a story um yeah. the beginning you know the introduction was good go on the, the pacing. pacing is yeah. like a little bit slow but i don't think mm. you can really fault it for that as much as you can other stories especially yeah. since on a second read through uh some of the sequences that were boring actually become like pretty unnerving once you know what mm. happens and it's not like with Lonely Freddy, where nothing happens till the end. It's like, it's a, it, the whole yeah. the thing is going the whole time. I like that, you know, the gradual progression of his state is obviously directly linked to the mini arenas, you know, climbing inside him while he's sleeping. The, um, the, uh, the ending. I mean, just the lore connections of the story alone were really cool. I like how the whole thing is a homage to Sister Location. The mini arenas, one of these obscure side characters, have their own story where they're actually, like, important and used well and kind of it's very scary uh but also you know not in like a too goofy a way like the, you know the, the mini arena has actually got a bit of spotlight which was cool and what i would say judging by my knowledge of the fnaf lore uh is that the the, the dream kind of flashbacks of the fun times getting mixed up with like uh, other like phobies he has like he sees funtime foxy like driving him in a taxi or something and like Ballora is like a surgeon um and he's on like a dentist like chair or something um i think that is the remnant that the mini arenas are carrying now like fusing with him kind of like it did with mike and sister location uh and i actually have a theory based on the story which i didn't realize until the second read through Mike was already dead before he got scooped. I think there might have been mini arenas climbing inside him before he got scooped. After night four at the very least. And also, you can get rare mini arenas in your popcorn, I think, in sister location. So, that Mike might true. have been yeah. already dying before he got scooped, guys. He might have been doomed from night one. That is, that is a just really a theory. interesting idea. Yeah, I think room for one more just overall... Um... A, like a scary story with a pretty unnerving presence. I could definitely see this being a tier. Yeah, it's also yeah. The, uh, the ending's horrifying. The way it you know ties together. You know, he couldn't help it. He opened his mouth to scream. The mini arena like having their little giggles and all of that stuff. Um, and how he like works out what's happening by the end. Also, there's just some lots of good small details. I like how there's this bio waste bin outside the entrance, and it's like. When you know what happened in Sister Location, that has a whole meaning. This story is so scary in a few different ways. I'm actually like, again, it's not a fetch or 1.35 a.m. I feel like if, um, I don't know, Stanley was like maybe uh, a, a bit more like nuanced, or if there had been a bit more than just him going to sleep at his job and seeing the mini arenas over and over, it would be an S rank, but it comes close. It's a solid story. 
pretty tense. Definitely, yeah, definitely solid story. Uh, I feel like this one has a bit more more relevance than some people think. There's a lot of yeah, ways this can go. There's a lot. Even within the context of Fazbear Frights, um, there's the snack space, so we know it probably ties into um, into the pit. There's yeah. a character named Amber, so it might tie into Blackbird. Uh, the bio waste oh, band, maybe that, that could be the remains of someone from uh, He Told Me Everything, for example. Like the, oh like my the god, like dude, so I didn't even thought about go. these. Oh my god, there's so many ways. Again, it's so there's mysterious so as well. There's so many possible stories that this could connect to. That's so cool. Uh, man, again, I, I need to finish going back through the stories, like, slowly, and it's taking me time, guys, because I'm reading and I'm writing for hours, and to be fair, I'm probably close to being done, because I think the lore relevance directly of, like, the main stories really decreases after Volume 6, but, like, when I do, yeah. I'm probably going to do more of this kind of stuff, because there's so much to unpack from this stuff that you could apply to the game timeline, but also the self-contained, like, what order did things happen in? I want to make a timeline, you know? satisfying yeah, it's Fazbear, fun Fazbear Frights time definitely something I'll be a part of Fazbear Frights mm, I know you've already done plenty on it I need to work it out for myself but like when I'm caught up we'll talk it, there's so much um all right if you're ready we can move on to the new kid which is another very important story I would say it's a big one yeah sounds good this is one that I've always had trouble ranking because I kind of see it as like a better version of Lonely Freddy essentially mm. but it also kind of has its own thing going for it as well uh, biggest complaint right off the bat is very slow pacing. It's another one of those stories that has a really interesting ending, but doesn't feel like it has a time yeah. for it. Yeah. I will say that the creepy thing about it, I find Devin actually very unnerving as protagonist. Even with yep. no paranormal lore or anything, there's people like that out there in the real world. Right? Like, pretty much everywhere that are actual, like, full-on sociopaths, and it's very creepy to think about. Yeah, uh, just responding to chat, some of it, uh, body swappy in the FNAF universe, more likely than you think, DJ. We haven't really had it like we have in Fazbear Frights before, but, like, kind of like sister location where they, like, took Michael's body, maybe kind of, you know, not so much body swapping as body stealing, but yeah, no, it's a thing. And Lonely Freddy, again, I know there's some theories about Lonely Freddy being, like, similar to the FNAF or Fredbear plush. FNAF 4 is so all over the place with theories, I've kind of given up on trying to solve it. Uh, but maybe, <laughs> maybe. Because if Lonely Freddy is automated, and, like, the, psych the Fredbear plush is automated, that means that William Afton doesn't have to be in the private room or wherever with his walkie-talkie speaking, you know, to the child, Evan Cassidy, whatever, you know, in those minigames. Because what I always thought was that, okay, so it's actually... William Afton indirectly trying to look after his child in his weird roundabout way using like a plush with like the walkie talkie, right? But it's like we see Purple Guy in a scene where Plush Rebbe is talking, you know, putting someone in a costume in the back room. I wonder, like, I had a really weird out there theory uh, because of Scott's pointing out, you know, what is seen in the shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. Is Purple Guy in FNAF 4 actually not Purple Guy? It's just some random dude. It's not William Afton. Because, like, at this point, I wouldn't even be surprised if that was somehow correct, because that, that is completely uninsured. That doesn't make any sense, but it's like, FNAF 4 was all about illusion and deception. It could be Red that Herring. That is kind of interesting. Yeah. Or maybe it was Retcon, you know. But I'm not going to go into that now. We can do that another time. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to take a while, so... <laughs> we'd be here forever. Oh, man. Yeah, um, but, uh, yeah. Monster trying to break him? Wait, which story are you talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, fair enough if that's really scary and yeah the um and yeah the fact that ella from 135 am doesn't have any significant bearing on novel ella like that she's similar she's a doll with similar appearance but she's not the same that was weird i just take that as like an alternate version of ella the same way there is you know a different spring bonnie in into the bit than the one we got in fnaf 3 you know like pretty much yeah yeah I i'm not gonna overthink that i don't think it's meant to be a big tie into the novels it's weird the novels kind of served sister location for lore but they haven't really had much uh connection to frights that it just all kind of comes back to the original like seven games by scott um not even that the original like five or six like peter sim and you see a kind of there to serve and explain lore as well partially obviously that's on the main purpose but yeah, there's a load of ways you can look at it, but yeah, uh, right? It's it's nightmare fuel. It's absolute nightmare fuel of having something inside you, which is a, something a fear that a lot of these stories uh, play on. But anyways, yeah, um, let's move on. So, new kid. I love the new kid. 
because of the lore, I think the lore is, the lore ties in there crazy, there's so much to unpack, because Devon, I mean, I liked Devon and Mick, because they were very, again, it was like Into the Pit, it was like Lonely Freddy, they took the time to, you know, flesh out the characters a lot, although I will say, whereas Into the Pit did that really well, Lonely Freddy didn't, in my opinion, I think this is somewhere yeah. in between with that, like, um, Devon and Mick are, you know, you can tell, you know, obviously they're both social outcasts, but they're very close to each other, despite being so different, and, like, they've got this whole dynamic, which is super interesting, and, you know, the story, unlike all the other stories we've seen, isn't told from one perspective, we change perspective, sometimes Devon's perspective is being told, sometimes it's Mick's, which is really interesting, and, you know, I think it worked for the plot, again, the plot was a bit slow moving at first, you know, I don't want, you know, stories that have rushed characters just so they can get straight to the horror concepts. That's not how you do good horror. But on the other hand, on the flip side, you know, they took a bit too long with it, I think. Um, and, you know, when we finally got to the creepy stuff, again, I like how they were exploring an abandoned Freddy's. That might be a bit of a trope, but they did it well in Fetch. I think they did it decently here. You know, some of the callbacks and the fact that we actually got a story that revolves around a spring lock suit, kind of. Um, again, there's another story revolving around a spring lock suit, which comes much later. But this one wasn't bad. Oh, I think yep. uh, the way they used the concept uh, was pretty good. Um, again, it was a bit too mysterious for me. And I think there's a lot of little things which didn't quite add up. And, like, it was a bit slow. So, I'm maybe... I think I might give it a C or a B. I kind of have mixed feelings about this. A C... A C or a B, I think, is good. I see, like, mixed things about this. Um, the fact that it's a story about both, like, you know, Golden Freddy and the Springlock suit is really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I think the characters are built up really well. Uh, my only complaint, one, it's slow pacing. It's better than Lonely Freddy because it takes time to build up the characters, but it, it still does. felt a little bit boring, a little bit unengaging, a bit too long sometimes. Um... But yeah, overall, I think that the character development is done uh, pretty well overall, for sure. Um, and the ending, I just, the thing is, I don't like the ending because it was too weird for me. It was yeah. too out there. It was too mysterious. It really I just didn't like, add up. like, it felt like you came out of yeah. nowhere. And it's like never addressed. It's just kind of unsatisfying. Um, this would have been better, I feel like, if they had touching. some connection to the epilogues, like, where it's revealed in epilogue 11 yeah. or whatever, like, you know, this happened and suddenly it all makes sense, but we never get that, it just doesn't make sense. No. I had a theory that, uh, the new kid, the, the titular new kid, uh, I forget his name, but I thought he might have actually uh, been, Kelsey. um... Kelsey, yeah, Kelsey. I thought Kelsey might have been somehow connected to Alec and Lonely Freddy, because he seemed really similar, and the way he behaved match the programming of a lonely freddy to like go towards uh you know the children or individuals who are outcasts and have like no like friends or other social like people to be with because that is kind of that's what he does again yeah. at the end but it's like how does that explain details like his eye color changing you know from alec i am because or maybe it's just someone else you know different lonely freddy but like how does that explain him escaping a spring lock suit after very clearly being absolutely skewered by the spring locks you know, and just regenerating his flesh, like, unharmed, like, it, it just doesn't make sense, like, is he a ghost? Because then, like, that doesn't even, how is a ghost following Lonely Freddy programming, even if it's, like, a, you know, it just doesn't make sense, there's just so many things that don't yeah. add up, but I also I, it felt like, like it was Lonely uh, Freddy connected. I felt like Eleanor might have had a part in it also, but there's some things Possible. that don't line up fully with that also. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. There's no, like, full explanation for it. It's just a really weird story that never really had all that much payoff. The character mm -hmm. development, um, it is good. It's not a bad story. It's just the ending is too mysterious for my taste, and the slow pacing does still drag it down a little bit, so I don't think we can rate it too high. Yes, Creeper. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't filled with heavy lore. I agree. I will say, actually, yeah. there is another theory which I heard about this after reading it, which I was like, oh, what? Uh, so I think someone on Reddit was saying that Devon and Mick uh, could be an allegory for William and Henry back in the early days of Freddy Fazbear's, Fred Bears, even. Which is super interesting to that me is because really interesting. if Henry and William had a dynamic, anything like Devon and Mick's, that recontextualizes their relationship, which is like just alluded to once in Pizza Sim, a lot more, which I like. Uh, there's definitely some interesting headcanon you can make with that. And uh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't filled with heavy lore, right? Yeah. Man, how long? I've been streaming for over an hour already, and we are only... We're only on volume three. Oh my oh god. Boy. 
I could probably go for like three lot, hours, but oh no, yeah, this be a long stream. I think we'll pick up pace a little bit as we get uh, further into it because some yeah. stories don't have quite as much to unpack in terms of war relevance, like for one thing. Yeah. Um. So it, it'll probably speed up as we uh, get a bit further along. But if we anyway, run out of time, um, I'm gonna... guys, we could do a second part like next week. That or is true. We could do yeah. that if you guys uh, want. Could always end up doing that but Anyways. anyway uh if you want to go back to your alignment chart for a second uh yes. then i will be right back in just a uh, minute i didn't mean to move the epilogue's heck all right yeah guys while we're waiting for ambience to come back uh feel free to like the video subscribe check out the links in the description below all the support is very much appreciated uh if you want to have got the qrtd you could be linked in the description with today's charity shout out that goes to crisis Together, we can end homelessness. Crisis is a UK-based charity that helps people get out of homelessness in the UK. You can donate, campaign, volunteer. There's lots of ways to help. It's a really good cause. I highly recommend you go check it out because homelessness is a serious issue and, like, the government isn't doing anything about it. So, you know, charities like this can help enable people in an organized and widespread way with just a few donations such as yours to help people find safe and secure accommodation. No one deserves to be living out on the streets. Uh, there's a lot more information you can read, obviously, if you want to, but yeah, please check them out. Links in the description. Uh, any donations uh, would be lovely. And yeah, obviously, the music credits are there. My social medias are there. I have a Discord server if you guys want to join that. This is like the central hub of, you know, my community if you want to, like, check this out, you know. And uh, yeah, I've also got, like, you know, a Fiverr if you guys are interested in my services over there. And Instagram for stream notifications. I've got, uh, you know, side YouTube channels. It's all in the description. So feel free to go check it out if you're enjoying. Uh, the support is very much appreciated. And uh, yeah, last thing I'll mention is that I'm trying to reach a thousand subscribers by the end of the month, guys, so I can get monetized. And if we do, I'll do not one, but two 1,000 subscriber specials just for you. So share. Share, share, share. See if we can hit a thousand subscribers. I'm challenging you guys. You've got like three weeks. I think we can do it if we push. But it's up to you because I can only do so much. Anyway, law relevance. Uh, I keep putting the epilogues on here when I don't mean to. Oh my god. Okay, fine. I'm just going to put all the epilogues just in this corner. Just because there's nothing in this corner. I'm not saying that they actually are done there. I'm just putting them there. Uh, so yeah. Um... Again, in terms of the tier list, like, you know, 135M was absolutely goated. Room for one more was pretty high. And the new kid was, it was alright. It was, it was there. You know, it existed. Uh, but in terms of lore relevance, 135M really didn't have much, honestly. But it doesn't suffer from it. Room for one more was very lore relevant. Almost as much as Mfetch, I'd say. And the new kid was, I guess, pretty lore relevant. Like, there's a lot of mysteries which are definitely connected to Golden Freddy and William Afton and Henry Emily and all that kind of thing. But... I don't really know what was going on with that. I'm gonna be real with you fellas. Uh, I'm just gonna shovel the epilogues down here because they're gonna keep distracting me otherwise. Um, and again, the epilogues will have their place, their time. Maybe if we finish some of the novels this stream, we can do the epilogues in a separate stream. But I want to try and get it all done in one stream just so people can find this. I'll definitely like uh, timestamp this if that helps so that people can jump to the different like segments. Uh, but yeah, this is. You know, the thing so far, we'll get to that tier list in a bit. But yeah, um, the Fazbear Frights, very interesting. Anyways, I don't know when Ambience will be back. I don't know how long it'll take. So I'm going to use the extra time that he's given me to catch up with chat and just, you know, stay stuff. I'll just do more shameless self-promo. Yes, in the middle of the woods, like the Fredbear's location, right? It's a very old, very dusty, dry location in the woods. Again, very, lots of FNAF places are in the woods. And yeah, Insta. Alright, Insta, you're gonna finish with the real Jake, but yeah. Your Insta's absolutely spot on with these, like, lore references, you know, consequences. Uh, Charlie is a robot, but, like, tied to the bite victim. What did you say about Man in Room 1280? Damn, really? Interesting, interesting. I'm surprised you discerned anything from In the Flesh, because as far as I'm concerned, that story had, like, no lore relevance. Bunny Call, I think, it goes a lot more deeper than the Afton family situation, but yes. I think it goes into William's psyche, possibly. Hopefully. But yeah, today's light goal and QO... Not QOTD, sorry. This is today's light goal and watch hour goal. Again, you can read for yourself, guys. If we get 20 likes or 40 hours of watch time, I'll do another stream. I might have to. Oh my god, I think we hit 20 likes. Yep, we just hit 20 likes on my screen. You guys hey, are definitely nice getting a part two. Hey, perfect. Dude, we just hit 20 likes. I am 
definitely going to do a part two on this. I'll tell you what, guys. If I run out of time today, uh, then I'll do three parts. You don't have to join all of those ambience, but I'll do more of this stuff because, I mean, there's just so much to talk about with Fazbear Frights. And I've been holding off on doing this till it was finished because I was really not able to keep up. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of Fazbear Frights debate directs this year. I might just do like extra ones in between the usual debate directs. I don't know. Okay, oh, yeah, let's definitely. get back to uh, it. I mean, if, if I have time, then I'll definitely join in. I love talking exactly. about Fazbear Frights. Like, one yeah, of my man. favorite parts of the series, so. It's definitely underrated by the majority of the fans. It's really cool to actually have, you know, people who've read all of them and, like, check them all out. Anyway, here's the alignment yeah. shots so far. I moved the epilogues down the bottom right just so I don't have to worry about them. They're not actually there. I mean, maybe they might be, but... Yeah, let's get on with this. So, volume four, step closer. How do you think about this one? All right. Um, this is another story that I actually, I actually really do like. Um, Agreed. I found the dynamic of Pete and Chuck to be, like, very interesting, uh, especially taking into account the possible parallels to Michael and, um, Evan or Bite Victim or, you know, like, whatever you want to call them. Um, I found yeah. it very interesting. I like the characters. Um, I think Pete is set up to be a pretty cool protagonist just because he's not completely unlikable like Alec or Devin. He's believably flawed, essentially. Yes, and they balance that so well, which is integral because he is the protagonist. And I like it, Pete's relationship with Chuck and how they go from, like, you know, um, agreeing to disagreeing and back again. And it's like, you know, they go through these kind of... <laughs> Pete makes these mistakes, but it ultimately, um, you know he and Chuck, you know, forgive each other and they, you know, make up, which is tragic because, of course, the ending, I mean, the ending was really good in this one. Um, yeah, I found this to be another story that was actually pretty intense, not quite yeah. on the level of Fetch or out of stock, but definitely close. Like, you were really, uh, I was really rooting for Pete to survive, like, the yes. entire way through. Yes. Uh, the he ending was, was heartbreaking, especially where Chuck, like, goes back to the pizzeria. Uh, right. To, like, this is like an 11 year old like fully willing to take on foxy's curse to get revenge uh to avenge his right birth. like i don't know it's just it's amazing writing i love pete and chuck's relationship all throughout yeah. the story um very intense really rooting for pete like all the way through um yeah and i think it's interesting how this is one of the first villains that doesn't really do anything directly but still manages to be intimidating right it's weird it's like you know foxy is one of the original gang he was you know the odd one out of the original freddies uh and he doesn't even like physically do anything he just has this curse which is put on pete uh and as well as obviously being linked back to fnaf 4 because you know he wore the foxy mask mike pete you know parallel like it's it's just a it's a unique take I think, and I think in the same way, it wasn't as intense, but I think like 1.35 a.m., the psychological horror kind of worked. Um, like, Pete has a nightmare of Foxy coming into his house and like, you know, taking off his eye and his arm. You've got that kind of song yeah, motif. Yeah, and that's how they start the story too, actually. Uh, they like start off with that and then they flash mm. back. Yeah, I like also, this is the first story since uh, New Kid, I think, where it is multiple perspectives. We sometimes have Pete's perspective and we sometimes have Chuck's, which is super interesting um, because, again, it adds to the tension, I think, especially at the end where Chuck's dad comes to pick him up from Freddy's and be like, just tell mom that you're at school because he's, like, run over to check on Pete and it's like, why? What's happened? It's like, we got to go. And then it's revealed that Pete's been, you know, <laughs> slammed by a truck. Instant, yeah. instantly killed in a tragic accident just as he was on his way to resolve everything and finally lift the curse off. Um, yeah. And then and the is, ending's pretty this interesting. Is another, well. Yeah, ending is very interesting. Um, but this is another case also. So it's kind of got like uh, this weird vibe to it where we never really figure out what was going on with Foxy. But the interesting mm. thing is that we actually do later. Um, when Epilogue 10 happens, we figure out that Eleanor was actually, like, essentially behind either most or all of this. Um, yeah. And it's really Everybody interesting, too, because this kind of explains how Pete is still, like, you know, conscious, like, after getting hit by the truck as his uh, arm and eye get harvested. Mm. Yeah. Again, but, the, the, yeah, the fact the cast is, like, consistent with that, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. This is, like, the only story that I feel like actually becomes scarier once we learn of Eleanor's involvement in it, because all of the other ones didn't necessarily become scarier. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just kind of like, I think it, they actually are diminished in some ways, but, like, I still enjoy them. I mean, 
I need to reread the last epilogue, so I haven't really thought about that yet. So, yeah, I'll definitely read these, like, a third or fourth time. I've read Into yeah. the Pit, like, five times already, I think, for a variety of reasons. But, um, the, uh... Yeah, the story wasn't nearly as intense or as scary as Fetcher 1.35am, and I feel like, um, I don't know, there was, uh, uh, but I think there's really not much, like, flawed with it. It didn't go, like, above and beyond with, like, lore references either, but, like, yeah, the pacing was fine, characters were great, the ending was scary, like, how Pete's, like, dead, but he can still see and hear, um, and when he's, like, you know, having his, like, um organs like harvested for like um people living people with injuries or whatever it's like a thing his mum makes him sign earlier on it's just great horror and then chuck goes back to like foxy stage in the maintenance from the back where pete originally brought him to scare him uh again the, the the brothers kind of like you know reconciling was great but it's like he goes back and tries to activate it but like nothing happens so it's like the curse was a one-time thing and I didn't pick up on this until I watched Dorco's video on it, but apparently there was some uh, black candle wax looking substance on the floor that looked like symbols. And... Yeah, like it's implied this may have been like some kind of ritual of some kind, which is really mm. interesting. It's weird. The first thing that came to mind was Sammy Lawrence's, like, you know, rooms from Bendy the Ink Machine Chapter 2. I know it's very random, but if you guys, I'm actually going to get up a reference, you know what I'm talking about. Um. I did my own streams in this, I should be able to find it, but, uh, there's a lot of ink in that game, obviously, so there's lots of, like, black stuff that's smothered on the floor, and when they did the graphics, they had, like, these candles and stuff, they look great. Um, I'm trying to find a good example. Let me see if I can find, uh, maybe, like, Ritual Room. But in the context of Fazbear Frights, yeah, it was something like this. Like, it wasn't actual candles, but there was, like, a black kind of waxy substance, I think it's described as. Um... I'm trying to find a good reference here. And it's like, yeah, like, Chuck thinks they're symbols, but he can't quite discern what they are. Yeah. And I think it's supposed to be, like, agony, because agony has been shown to, like, manifest as a kind of black goo, but that's something I still don't fully understand, and I need to look into more. It's a bit weird, mm -hmm. but, like, the, I think the idea of Fast Ref Rights is that everything is connected. If it's not Eleanor, it's, like, uh, spoilers, uh, Andrew from the Stitch Wraith, the Vengeful Spirit, like, you know, shooting off his agony into loads of stuff at the you know, uh, the distribution center after Man in Room 1280, long story, uh, like, with, um, and, you know, like, 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 charging them up with, like, you know, the emotional energy which can, like, manifest, it's weird, I, I again, I like, it, the, the explanation, it's, like, it's almost there, but you really gotta look deeply into it, and it's, like, the deeper you go, the more likely it could be that you're wrong, and you're misinterpreting something, or overanalyzing something, which happens, but, yeah, it all goes back to fetch, Fetch epilogues yeah. two and three, and epilogues ten and eleven, I guess, from the plot. Yeah, oh, Step man. Closer is like a story that I feel like is—it's not quite as good as Fetch, but it's very similar to Fetch in a lot of ways, where they kind of balance a lot of things at the same time. Yeah. Uh, the characters are well developed; like the villain is intimidating, um, the pacing is good. Like overall, I think it's just a very solid story. I would say not quite S tier, but pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Hello, Acro. Welcome to the stream. Thanks for joining, buddy. Um, yeah, I don't know, Creeper Hags. This is a bit weird. I mean, I will say, having William Afton not be the overarching villain was a breath of fresh air, and we'll talk about that later. But yeah, I don't know. I think it, it, it makes things better in some ways and worse in others. Uh, it's weird. I don't know. I don't know how to think about it yet. I need to reread everything, like the epilogues especially. Let's get on uh, with, first of all, uh, putting the volume four. No, hold on. Where are we up to? No, we're still in volume four. Let's get on with the next volume four story. Dance with me. So, oh boy, you don't like the story. I don't like the story. This why this almost ruined 1:35 a.m. for me in a way because I feel like it is 1:35 a.m. but worse in every possible way. Where Ballora isn't intimidating, not even the setup is intimidating, because Ballora doesn't really even do anything. Um, yeah. I don't find Casey nearly as likable of a protagonist as Delilah. I think she's still reasonably believable, so she's not, like, awful. Yeah, but yeah, she's more like Pete. She's very, more flawed, but yeah. Yeah, like... yeah um, Casey isn't, like, a terrible protagonist by any means, just not quite as good as Delilah, in my opinion, but uh, Ballora, like, the overall setup just really... 
it doesn't feel threatening to me at any point. There wasn't any point where I was actually scared for Casey. I felt like it was always going to be a good ending or like an ambiguous ending. And technically mm. it does end with an ambiguous ending in a way, but it's not really one that makes me think very much. Nah, I, uh, okay, I actually like this story, but it does have flaws. I will say I liked Casey. She was a very flawed protagonist with a pretty believable, like, setup, motivations, thought process. And I like the journey that she undergoes to kind of redeem herself. I think the introduction and the start was a bit weird. And Ballora's presence is basically non-existent. Like, there's no tension or threat like there is with the other stories that Zambia's mentioned. Because what basically happens is that Casey uh, has these special 3D glasses that she can see a hologram. What she thinks is a hologram of Ballora following her. And even when she's not wearing them, she can see leaves, like, swirling around where Ballora is. And so that's it. Ballora's just getting gradually closer. And it's a bit weird, but it's like, okay, well, what's going to happen? Because I was just kind of confused. I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea if it would be a good or a bad ending. Um, and, you know, like, I'm glad that Ballora got her own story, but I feel like they could have utilized her character way more. There is so much you could do with Ballora, which just was not done here. Um, yeah, this is a very lame way of featuring a character as uh, mysterious and as prominent as Ballora. They should not speak. A lot more here. And yet, I'm glad uh, we got a happy ending for once. Like, I, I know it could be ambiguous, but it very much felt like a happy ending to me. Like, it seemed pretty clear that it was a good it ending. It feels more on the good side, yeah. Because I, I don't know how it could really go bad. I mean, I don't think Ballora would be hostile to the kid who's supposed to have the glasses that Casey eventually gives him to. I don't think Ballora's going to do anything. Uh, but I think, There's again, like a it's... There's possession thing that could have happened. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a karmic sort of justice like thing, yes. Yeah. But yeah, and also weirdly has a tie-in with FNAF AR, because this is the only Fright story which I thought could actually explain the, like, cloaking devices they have in that game, but, I mean, that game is just, Yeah, like, that's really the only parallel I can see here. It seems like it weird. was going to be a system location parallel at first, and then, like, uh, help wanted, maybe, but it mm. only, the only thing I can see is special delivery, and even that is kind of loose. Special delivery is, like, not really, I mean, it's can, but it's, like, people tend to ignore it. People in the game files, they even called Security Reach FNAF 9, so they skipped, you know, uh, Special Delivery the same way they skipped FNAF World. And I think that yeah. says a lot about the lore. I think, I think, yeah, I liked Dance With Me, but I've got to be honest, guys, it is a D. I think there was so much potential that was lost. I think the reason I enjoyed it still was because Casey as a character carried it for me. I like that she um, has to go through several attempts at redeeming herself to finally do the right thing. It was really interesting to see such a geographical FNAF story. Usually they're very contained in a small place, but she goes like across the USA, multiple states. It's crazy. Um, yeah. But yeah, if, no, Ballora like, was... If there's a redeeming quality to this one, it's how well developed Casey is and how interesting of a protagonist she is. Everything else falls flat for me. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I'm not going to be given an E. I still liked it, but uh, yeah, not, not the highest. Coming home, next up. Okay, this story. so... This story seems controversial in terms of how good it is. Really? Um, I actually think that this is a very good story. So this is the first time and still I think the only time in any canon FNAF material that we actually get a look at what the family of a victim of the missing children's incident experiences. And it's a yeah. very realistic and a very tragic setup i think that is done incredibly mm. well uh people have argued over how much sense the story makes how rooted it is in fnaf uh i think it's actually extremely rooted in fnaf it has potential yeah. to explain quite a bit about the series Agreed. it has quite a bit of more relevance and it's just a very tragic story and a very different story compared to everything else in the series yeah it was an incredibly emotional one it has a brilliant plot twist which utterly confused me first time reading and I got later on. The, you know, it follows Susie and Samantha, who are two uh, young girls, sisters, who have been kind of divided over a tragedy. And uh, yeah, actually seeing the grounded, humanistic, like actual impact of the families of the victims. Why has it taken this long just to see one of those? That is so important. And it's like never seen a reference in any of the games, none of the novels, but we finally got it in this short story. For that alone, it's an S rank. But let's not forget that, uh, you know, it's got a pretty interesting structure. It does actually follow like night cycles, but not in a way that's too repetitive. 
uh, I think the, you know, the, the, the sisters, you know, are pretty, like, fleshed out as characters, like, Samantha's very distant and aloof, but you can understand why, especially later on, and Susie, mm-hmm. uh, how contrasted and dynamic they are just really adds to their relationship, I think, and especially that crowning moment at the end, where they, you know, you go outside and hug it out and finally, like, reconcile, uh, and as well, they actually used uh, Chica, the animatronic Chica, in a pretty interesting and intimidating way as well. It felt pretty threatening. I wasn't really sure what the stakes were, like what would happen if Chica, you know, caught them. But uh, And also, yeah, I understand that some people are going to be like, well, how does this make sense? How is Chica, you know, who is not a ghost, she's like physically there, there when she would, you know, not be able to leave the pizzeria because of what we saw in FNAF 3. And I think there's a way you can explain that because... Yeah, well, we talked about this There's a, a lot of ago, this stuff. Yeah. We did. There's basically, guys, in Fazbear Frights, there's a lot of paranormal stuff that is rooted in a very, like, vague and mysterious kind of science. The best way I can explain it at the moment, or, uh, that is my understanding of it, is that through emotional energy and memories and or a conscious spirit or just, you know intentions or emotions that are kind of like haunting something through this zero point field it's like an energy field um paranormal events can just manifest she can can just manifest herself because the remnant of Susie, the memory and the you know intentions of Susie are being projected in that home that area which is why chica comes to take Susie away each night because Susie's remnant is basically split into two places in reality her corpse is rotting away inside Chica. It's being stuffed in there, and she's bonded with the animatronic, and during this story, Chica's probably in the FNAF 1 location, terrorizing the night guard. But at the same time, there's this, um... Like, separate Chica. Like, this kind of, like, ghostly... Well, it's not a ghost, it's, like, physical, but, like, this duplicate Chica that manifests because, uh, like, Susie's remnant is, like, still stuck in the location you know, that she has unfinished business in. The whole thing revolves around resolving unfinished business. That's another aspect of, like, how haunting works in FNAF. It's kind of complicated. There's not, like, a single defined set of rules for every single character ever. Like, Springtrap alone, as an adult, is quite uh, different to all the other animatronics, and, like, how and why he's, like, a thing, why he exists. But, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's kind of like, complicated. My understanding of coming home is that Chica is essentially the monstrous version of Susie that is mm, yeah. uh, beginning to overtake her own personality, essentially, after she becomes Chica. Yes, Creeper Hacks has summed purposes. it up perfectly, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah it's basically. like Susie's, Susie's, like, feral side, you know, which was kind of... Mm-hmm. This is another thing that's kind of been alluded to in the novels and Ultimate Custom Night, you know, the others are like animals, but I am very aware. Um... You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah, there's a whole thing of also the spirit, Susie, being a separate consciousness entity to the animatronic, Chica, which I'm not going to get into now, which was shown at least with, uh, like, Elizabeth and Baby in the novels, which kind of clarified Sister Lucasia for me, because I still get confused about some of Baby's dialogue in that game. Anyway, um, oh boy, yeah, let's put, let's, let's just, put this up here. <laughs> yeah, just overall, uh... Incredible story, very emotional, great concept, great writing, just all around. I really can't find hardly any flaws with it. I think it's um, yeah, just a great concept, and it's executed very well. Man, let's look, yeah, honestly. Okay. Um, I'm just putting these on my alignment chart. Yeah, coming home. Oh, my Lord. That one was, you know. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's an S rank. It's an S rank story. All right. <laughs> All right. So there's technically twelve volumes. Um, so we're coming up on five and six now. We're getting about halfway through. I don't know. We're one hour thirty five in. If I stream for three hours, I think I could finish this. I might do the epilogues in a separate stream though. We will see. So uh, the next one up is Bunny Call. Bunny Call. The starter. I like Bunny Call. Five. I'm glad you do, because I love it. I think it's actually an underrated gem. The uh, I was rereading it recently. So, Bunny Call not only has a really interesting dilemma and conflict, it follows uh, a father, um, which we haven't... I don't think we've really like, seen yet. We've seen fathers before, but we haven't seen the father be the protagonist, who yeah. basically is getting really sick and frustrated of having everything loaded onto him. All of his 
responsibilities of his wife and his children and his work all just loaded onto him too much at once, and they're going on this holiday, but the holiday is like this, you know, uh, it's, it's like this, uh, camp in the woods, um, which is like, you know, uh, just like really busy, and it's like everything's like organized and like, you know, a regimented, and he just wants to chill out and do some fishing. Uh, and also, again, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern, so I'm not going to claim that this has any meaning, but fishing came up in Step Closer, and fishing came up in Bunny Call, and Old Man Consequences looks like he's fishing in UCN. I'm just wondering if that's somehow connected, because the person fishing in Step Closer is Bill, who is the, you know, William Afton kind of parallel, roughly, loosely. Uh, and I'd say that the entirety of Volume 5 is actually all about William Afton because each story is Wait, connected is, to is Spring Pete, Bonnie, Spring Is Tram. the father in, um, in Step Closer, he's actually named Bill? Yeah, he's named Bill. Bill is in William. I don't William. know how I didn't pick it. Okay, that confirms basically that, like, I mean, I think we already knew it. but that It's already Step a parallel, Closer. but, like... Yeah, yeah, like Pete's a Michael Afton parallel, there's no way. Any, exactly. So, what I'm saying is, if fishing comes up again in one of the later stories, and I've just forgotten about it, then I think there's definitely a theory to be made there. Twice could be a coincidence, oh, yeah. though. Like, I don't know. Which is why I'm kind of not on board with the whole Evan Afton thing, because, like, two Golden both makes sense and fills a lot of gaps, but I don't see how it could have, like, possibly been planned, because it's like, before Frights, there was, like, no evidence, and the name Evan, the way it was found in the logbook was weird. I'm not going to get into that, but I don't know. It's... But obviously, yeah, like... Um, yeah, but yeah, we, Bunny Call... missing a name. Bunny Call, I think, is very interesting. There's a lot of potential lore parallels with the Afton family, mm. uh, potentially, like, some loose parallels with Henry. Um, yeah. Just all around, yeah, like a really, uh, really interesting story. But the thing that I like most about this is how it actually translates the gameplay of FNAF into a Fazbear Fright story. Right? And just to do it well. Yeah. Yeah. There's been attempts think... at this before, yeah. like, Room for One More, and I don't think it translated fully all that well. But no. Bunny Call is the first story that takes the gameplay of FNAF and actually makes it into a good story. Yeah, and it's like actually not just there on the side, it's like they are fused. The gameplay and the story are one thing and they like support each other. Um, I love the tension in this story. I love the psychological horror of like, you know, uh, uh, Bob is the protagonist. His name's Bob. Bob. I thought of The Incredibles when I was rereading this. Uh, okay. No, his wife's not called Helen. It, uh, I can't remember what it is, but yeah. Um, Bob, you know, he makes this uh, one Wanda. choice. Yeah, that was a wonder. He makes this one choice, and he's saying to Philip later on, it's like, you know, well, I made that choice and everything was out of my control since, but I still caused it. And he feels guilt, which is kind of like what was going with Fetch. And I think guilt is quite a good... Um, uh, emotion for the protagonist of a horror story to feel. I think I, I like that kind of theme, karmic justice, uh, which was a big thing in New Kid as well, which is threaded throughout all the books. But yeah, Bunny Cool, you know, the antagonist, Ralpho, uh, is pretty creepy. He never speaks. He's just this random, you know, bunny looking mascot. And like, you know, he, there's something a little bit off about him. He looks a bit creepy to begin with. And, but then, you know, He's, like, scuttling around the woods and tries to get in the cabin later on. And it's like, Bob thinks first, well, I don't know, he's just a guy, uh, you know, one of the counsellors in a costume. I'm sorry, we don't want the bunny call. I don't want to play a prank on my family and scare them and wake them up. I've changed my mind. I feel regret about this. But then he just keeps trying to get in. And it's like FNAF 4 or FNAF 1. He's, like, got to go to the windows on the side, you know, the door in the middle and, like, you know, go up to them and, like, hold them shut. You know, surprise like, Ralph, I wasn't breathing, to be honest, but there was one weird detail. Yeah. Again, because of the lore, there's so much lore. The whole thing, I think, is potential parallels to William Afton and his relationship with his family and his whole psyche before they all died. Um, and that's that, um, Ralpho bleeds. Bob isn't sure if Ralpho's a mascot or an animatronic, but he bleeds, and I think that means one thing. Ralpho is a springlock suit. He has to be, right? But, like, who's wearing it? Or is it not even, like, a person? Is it, like, with Chica in Coming Home, where it's, like, someone died in that suit, and it's, like, the memory of that is manifesting or haunting the actual suit, even though it's empty? It's weird. There's a Maybe. lot of details um, like that. I don't think Ralpho is a springlock suit, is the thing, because no. he's being actively worn as a character. Yeah. Um, like, someone would notice if something happened there, basically. I suppose, um, yeah. 
I feel like it's more likely that Ralpho... I don't know exactly what Ralpho is, but I feel like he's connected to the Spring Bonnie from Into the Pit oh, yeah. somehow because he's described very similarly. Yeah, he might not be a Spring Lock suit. He might just be somewhat organic in some way. Uh, Pit Bonnie is described as having, like... Again, it's, like, very unclear if it's, like, a flesh and blood rabbit or a suit or someone wearing a suit or an animatronic. It's, like, unclear. And maybe that's the point. Maybe it could be any... Maybe he is, isn't, this or that. Um... But yeah, there's so much to say about this game. I love, you know, how Bob starts off thinking like, yes, I'm going to play this prank my family. It's going to go great. And as the day goes on, he you know, starts getting paranoid and he can't sleep. He keeps waking up and he has a talk with another uh, dad who had the bunny call called Philip. And they both start like basically oversharing. Uh, and it was interesting because like Philip is like, you know, oh, yeah, when my mum died, my dad, beca he became a horrid dad. I've become just like him and he walks away and he's all bitter. But Bob is like, I, like, I've never felt, you know, that I, like, I've never need, known what I need to do so much in my life. And he feels absolutely determined to save his family. And it's like, this kind of, like, two versions of maybe William Afton, since the family is, like, structured the exact same. One little girl, two little boys, and a wife. It's, like, maybe showing his good and bad sides and the kind of, like, you know, um, what happens when you you know, try and redeem your mistakes what happens when you don't. Yeah, it's interesting. There's, like, there's a lot of lore there. Um, Bob is a... We've talked about this a lot. Bob is, like, a very believable and flawed protagonist, I think, which yeah. uh, adds to the story. Um, he's not a bad person. You can see where he's coming from mm. in pretty much every way. But, yeah, again, he makes him. a mistake that almost ends in tragedy, just like what's happened in so many other stories. Mm. Um... And here's the thing that I love about Bunny Call, besides it, like, taking the gameplay of FNAF and making it into an actual good story. Um, so, the thing that I love about Bunny Call is just how high the stakes are at pretty much every point yeah. in the story. And when Bob realizes that, I feel like it hits the reader exactly how much he has to yes. lose. Yes. Um, where, and here's the other thing that I think makes it really scary. The, this story needed to have a good ending to be as scary as it is. Because it keeps the stakes so high because of how mysterious Ralpho is. You have no idea what would have happened if he actually got in the cabin. All you know is it would have been really bad. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I don't know. It's a very scary and very intimidating setup. The, to the me, ending's and it's awesome. Well. by the fact it has a good ending. And then yeah. right at the end, too, where after everything turns out okay, uh, then after the camp counselor named Evan, of course, there's so many freaking Evans in this series, um, mm. stands up and, like, makes the announcement, uh, that the person who was supposed to be in the Ralpho costume, like, never showed up. And, they slept over like, and Bob has this in. realization where he, uh, has no idea what happened, basically. And it, it's I like, mean, it's, a, yeah. it's very well done. It's very well done psychological horror. It's extremely intimidating. The characters are well set up. I yes. really like this. I'm not sure if it's S tier, but I would put it close. Right? Like, I'm, I'm not sure if it's A tier or S tier, because that plot twist was executed really well. Um, I'm not sure what I would change to make it. Like, yeah, I better. really can't find, like, any big flaws in it. I might give it S tier, honestly. If I can't think of something to improve about it, there's no reason for it not to be an S tier for me. It, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like, it's a really good story. Maybe maybe a bit more, just on what Ralph is, like, a bit more clues. Because, I again, Ralph was never referenced again in the epilogue, so that's kind of another loose end. Um, that's true, yeah. yeah this could have been better if it was referenced in some way in the epilogues. That reminds me, I had a theory. So you know oh, how yeah. Eleanor has been showing up throughout all of the stories, uh, and that was a plot twist revealed in like epilogue 10, 11. Mm -hmm. I've realized that it's possible that Eleanor was hiding in plain sight in Bonnie Call all along, because when really? Bob gets the Bonnie Call, it begins with a woman named Marjorie, who's like sorting out the papers for the activities listed, and then she looks around, like she doesn't want anyone to see or hear this, she leans in and Bob can't hear what she's saying, she has to repeat herself, would you like the bunny call, and she explains it, and she even has this little laugh, which is described as devilish, and I think the whole story is um, partly about temptation, because for me, bunny call could also represent William Afton's uh, temptation to do evil, you know, with like the suit the suit is symbolic of his actions because he always wore it during his crimes and in the novels he has this kind of symbiotic relationship with it which is really weird and i feel like it's the same thing here it's like ralpho is tempting bob you know to have this like you know the, the, this kind of 
you know, ju well, you could justify it, but like I'm quite a petty revenge on his family, which he comes to regret and realizes isn't good. But Marjorie, I think Marjorie might actually be Eleanor in disguise because we know Eleanor that can is, disguise herself as human. That is actually a really interesting observation that I might yeah. head canon that now because that makes everything Same. about this story actually Same. make sense. Um, so here's like my only complaint with it. I was initially thinking, what if the bunny call? doesn't exist essentially because i've had thoughts of philip not being necessarily all that real also and we're like a manifestation of uh like bob's conscious or one side of him okay uh, but the camp counselor at the end does talk about ralpho and talk about the bunny call so we know that it yeah. is real there's also philip as well bob goes outside during the night and he talks to another dad who had the bunny call so the bunny call exists it's real uh but what are you gonna say yeah, it's it's just confusing to me, basically. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why Eleanor would be, like, assuming Marjorie is Eleanor, I don't know why she'd be so right? secretive about it, uh, like, leaning in and whispering to Bob about it, if uh, yeah, it is, in fact, good. like, a real thing that uh, everyone else at the camp has experienced. Mm. But it's still, like, a really interesting theory that I'd like to work with more. It just fits for me, because, again, Ralpho wasn't mentioned in the epilogues, but that doesn't mean he wasn't there in epilogue 6 in the Afton Amalgamation somewhere. I'm sure he could have been. You know, Ralpho, I feel like Ralpho has to be connected to Fazbear Entertainment somehow, and it might be, like, an old, you know, uh, character like El Chip, like a cameo character who maybe got sold, you know, Bonnie Call, I think, is taking place in a time after Freddy's is kind of closed down, because I think Bob also mentions that he used to go to uh, family pizzerias and see animatronics. It's like a throwaway line which might be referencing Freddy's. It's, you know, you never know, really. Um, but, you know, if Marjorie is actually Eleanor in disguise, I don't know why she would be there, but, you know, maybe she could have, you know, obviously infected uh, Ralpho with agony, so the suit's kind of now alive and it can manifest, like, organic you know, blood or, or whatever, because, like, she has those, like, tentacle things later on. There's a lot of weird stuff like that, which just isn't really explained. I'm assuming for almost two hours. That's not a long time by my standards, but yeah. I'm just gonna try and keep going. I'm gonna pick up the pace, because the latest stories I have less to say about anyway, so don't worry about it, guys. Yeah, we're, we're, we're we might end up making a part two of this, uh, if we can't get that far into it, but yeah, yeah we'll see what happens. Yeah. Again, I could always start earlier next time as well, because I started a bit later because Ambience Time Zone sees in the USA like seven hours behind me or something. So, you know. Six if, hours, if, yeah. So, yeah, like if we'd started earlier, it would have been like 10 a.m. for him. And like, I would never stream before 1 a.m. He's actually doing his own stream later on. Uh, you should guys should check that out if you don't haven't already. I'm going to be watching that. Yeah, yeah. Starting at, th starting at three. That's like the reason I don't want this to go too long is I want to log off yeah. in like about that's an in like, hour and 10 minutes each yeah. lunch before I get started. Yeah, tell you what, guys. Tell you what. We could... Let me think about this. We could just look at like... We could just finish with uh, volume six. Maybe do epilogues one to six. And then just come back to this and do volumes like seven to twelve. That might be an idea. I think that's that's probably a good idea, um, because like even though we have less to say about the later volumes, I still have quite a bit to say about them. Mm, like they're not as yeah. more relevant, but there's still quite a lot to unpack in yeah. the theming and the characters and like Agreed. all that. I've got a lot to say about some stories and like Pizza. That's Kit. the primary thing. Exactly. Pizza Kit's fantastic. We'll get to that. But yeah, like Cliffs onwards, yeah, there are a lot less obviously like some of these are unrecognizable as Five Nights at Freddy's stories, but yeah, let's just let's just finish volume six and Let's see what we've got. So, that was Bunny Call. Yeah, I'm going to S-rank Bunny Call. I think it it's just in there, but I think... I don't know. I think it's there. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, no. It's everyone's favorite. Oh. I'm, we're not, I'm not even going to talk. I don't need to talk about this. Oh, God. <laughs> in the flesh. It's in the flesh, guys. Oh, my gosh. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Completely unlikable protagonist reduces the impact of all the horror because I don't care what happens to him uh, yep. No real reason, you know Logic consequences or rationale behind literally anything that happens in this story weird tie into help wanted that doesn't really tell us anything about the law and uh, Oh my god, Scott. How the fuck did this actually make it to print? <laughs> I don't know. It's um <laughs> There's bad story. There's Fazbear Frights there's bad stories, and then there's In the Flesh. Yeah. This is the only Fazbear Fright story that I legitimately wish didn't exist. There's some stories that yeah. I don't like as much, but I still think have their own place, like Prankster, for example. Yeah. This story 
shouldn't have ever made it into a Fazbear Fright story, and I don't know how it did. Um, I know, like, probably everyone who's watched the stream who's ever heard of the story is probably, like, a bit sick of people just taking a massive dump all over it, but they're completely yeah. justified in doing so, trust me. Yeah, I, this I agree. Is really I've bad. read it. It's. I'm glad that I got spoiled on this, because it was so needlessly disgusting. Like, I... The fact that the protagonist is called Matt, and <laughs> he has this fleshy version of Springtrap grow inside him. He has to cut himself to get it out. It's like a virus pregnancy kind of It's disgusting. He's a man, by the way, so none of this makes any sense. Um, yeah, it just, that freaked me out for like a week. <laughs> Maybe not that long. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely, it, it was the scariest one for me, but for all the wrong reasons, because this is how horror, in my opinion, isn't done. There's just no point. It doesn't say anything about society. It doesn't develop any characters. Matt is never redeemed. He doesn't do anything to even remotely redeem himself from the asshole that he is. He, you know, pushes his friends away. He's, you know, completely misogynistic. Like, there's nothing to like about him. He's arrogant. He's a douchebag. Like, the, also, the fact that in-universe there's supposed to be a Five Nights at Freddy's game called Springtrap's Revenge, where Springtrap is a video game character inside a VR game inside the universe and is apparently canon and connected to the other stories just doesn't just doesn't make sense, and it completely nullifies any kind of presence Springtrap could potentially have, ever. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this one just isn't canon. It's that bad. If we can all agree that it isn't canon, then, like, it won't be canon. Yeah, I heard some connections made a while back about, uh, like, the mm. flesh trap thing that comes out of hey, map creeper. potentially... Uh, connecting to the plush trap chaser from out of stock. I thought about I thought that too. Was an interesting idea, yeah. but I also didn't want it to be true because that would mean in the flesh was canon or somehow linked into it, which I really didn't want. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, uh, about what you said about the story freaking out also, like, I understand why, but this is actually one of the least scary stories in Fazbear Frights for me. Uh, yeah. This is the reason where, like, why I laugh at jump scares sometimes in FNAF fan games is because. Fat. It's so unbelievably over the top that it somehow circles all the way back around from scary to funny. Yeah, it's just goofy. Uh, like, now that yeah. I've, like, adjusted to it, it's like, again, the thing that I um, am very relieved about this story, the things which I suppose it did right were that uh, it's not referenced or connected to anything else whatsoever. So as far as we care, it's not canon. Um, and yeah. also... It is so unrealistic, it's not scary. Because the scary stuff is stuff that could happen in the real world. This could not possibly be real. This could never happen. And it just doesn't make sense for so many reasons. It I might it honestly give it its own context character. context of the FNAF actually. universe. That's what Even you know, more so, like, yeah. That it's going over the top. Yeah, I'm actually um, going to give this its yeah. own entire category. Uh, e, F, well, there's no G. F I think for they, in I think they felt that in the order flesh. to make the gore of the ending acceptable they needed to have a protagonist that was completely unlikable so that people felt uh you know like significantly less bad for him yeah but that doesn't make sense like i i think they learned this later on but why would you even do that in a horror story it's supposed to be you know it's supposed to be scary if the protagonist is so mm. unbelievably unlikable then yeah. There's no way, like, that um, it can really be scary, especially when it's that uh, unrealistic. It's just over the top, it's messy, it's gray, and most of all, it's all of that for no reason. Uh, yeah. They just thought that by making something incredibly over the top and as gory as possible that it would be scary, but at the same time, you can tell they were having second thoughts about that because of how they wrote the protagonist. This is exactly so just the kind messy. of horror I don't it's like. all over the place. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Just messy. It's all over the place, and it's way over the top, and it's just... There's no, there's really no redeeming qualities to this one that I can there's see. There's no um, development. Yeah. Also, that's an interesting idea, Creeper Hex. The reason that I don't think it's true is because if that's true, then Prankster has no reason to exist. Exactly. We got Prankster, which was, well, we'll get to that, but I didn't like it that much. Um, you know what? For Volume Five, to stick with the theme, for the middle story, instead of in the flesh, uh, they should have had what we found. Now, I know this story isn't the best, and we'll talk about that, but, like, they should have had what we found, because that actually would have fit in much better as a story with Springtrap. 
And then they could have swapped out in the flesh for one of the like scrapped stories because this should have been scrapped yeah. like even if this showed up in volume 12 i'd be surprised but at least then it's like oh well these were scrapped they're not used so it's like we know it's you know yeah much so it. from what i know of the yeah. scoop like there's no spoilers that i've gotten on it aside from like the general premise but the scoop actually yeah. seems pretty similar to in the flesh to me uh really? at first glance because oh, of the whole like meta thing so i think mm. it might have been better if they went with that instead of being yeah flesh, depending on how good that is i don't know if it's good or not Again, I mean, again, they could have just... Some of these stories, honestly, just shouldn't exist. I mean, I wouldn't really say about any of them quite as much as this. But, like, there's also... This is one of the things that frustrated me with Fazbear Frights by the time we got to the end of it. Um, because there were lots of things that would have been really cool to see that just didn't happen. There's a lot of characters um, and a lot of, like, things that are more closely tied to the original games that we never got to see. Which could have been done well. Like... I wouldn't have minded stories that were actually set, like, in Freddy's, or, you know, that reference things more specifically, like the FNAF 2 location, you know. Mangle and the puppet would have been great characters to have their own stories, but they never got anything. Although, Balloon Boy kind of got one, in a way, which was alright, but, you know, like, a lot of- Bonnie yeah. the Bunny! Bonnie the Bunny did not get his own story. Foxy and Chica did, and the Freddy one got scrapped, but Bonnie didn't get his own story. It's just Unless criminal. you can't see Bonnie's, which I really don't. Oh shit, right, forgot about- I- that one, I purged that from my exist- from my memory. <laughs> I just purged it from my memory. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because we'll, we'll I hate it that much. Part two. I, I mean, don't it's think not... it's as bad no. as a lot of people think it is, but we'll talk about it in part two. Yeah, it's not- it's really not that bad, but I didn't like it. Um... Anyway, yeah, let's- let's move on. We're- we're wasting time here. Uh... Sorry, I'm- So I'm there's two nervous. F tiers. Yeah, I just added this as a joke, honestly, that should- <laughs> I, I'm I'm gonna put it in F. Like we're gonna take this one seriously, but yeah, uh, boom. All right, all right. Man in room 1280. That's the next story up. I was just reading this one today. This is a very interesting one for me, and another one yeah. that I have largely mixed feelings about. On mm -hmm. one hand, it's probably got the most lore relevance out of yeah. pretty much any Fazbear Freak story that I can think of, and it's very different probably. than any other story. And I think it does that well, but. At the same time, that weirdness and kind of disjointedness from the rest of the stories don't serve it all that well, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah I feel like this story had a bit too many... Okay, so, I love the concept of the man in room 1280. I thought that was both, like, creepy, not like horrified, but like, very weird, unsettling. Um, and, you know, I like how uh, the protagonist is this, like, well-meaning, you know fool at the end of the day i love arthur but he's a fool because you know he, what he does directly leads to a lot of events throughout the whole like series and a lot of like yeah the things that here's happen. the thing she i don't said. really like arthur very much as a protagonist because he's one of the ones that feels the most bland for me and like most mm. of all like he's only there to serve the plot more so than the Fair. plot revolving yeah. around him hmm he was so, definitely I don't unique. Really like him very much as a protagonist. But yeah, like he's, he's a priest yeah. who like sees the good in everything and is like unrelentingly positive. But it's like I don't know. You don't. I feel like they could have done more with that conflict. Maybe uh, there's also like uh, who? What are they? What do they call her? Maya or something? Like there's a young girl who started working who he meets and she's cool. Um, and she just kind of exists. And then there's like the three nurses, kind of like witches, honestly, who are like. You know, they're pretty interesting how like, they're crazy. portrayed to be really bad people, but you can like completely understand and actually like root for them as you start to learn right? more about they, it. They actually, they were actually uh, the uh, the good guys in a weird way. Like the morality of this one's really yeah. interesting how it's flipped. Like uh, Nurse Ackerman specifically, we get a, a flashback of uh, her son dying on like a deathbed, and like that, like a whole just like a brief flashback that kind of reinforces a whole character and explains why she seems so like callous and uncaring on the outside and i don't know it, like i thought that was really interesting the uh the moral dynamic because it's like what it's unclear what's good what's bad and that's something that's emphasized start to finish i mean it's called the whole heracles hospital morality. yeah yeah but like it's got cerberus you know the you know god of hades hell you know, at the front. Uh, so it's like very murky. It's like, is this good or bad? And I think the whole story is symbolic of evil escaping hell. Uh, there is something evil in the man in room 1280. And, um, you know, 
the uh, ever optimistic Arthur is tricked into taking it where it wants to go and unleashing it on the world. Um, I think I'll give it a yeah. C or a B. Like, I liked a lot of the concepts and the plot of this story, but the characters were hit and miss. Definitely hit and miss. Um, yeah, more relevant is huge. But... I find it weird how the nurses who have, like, pretty low character development are actually even more well-developed than Arthur, uh, yeah. for example, or Maya, yeah. or, like, any of them. It's really strange, because um, I feel like they could have done a lot more of Arthur's character, because I've actually met people kind of like him before, in real really? life, where they see the good and everything to the point that it's a fault. Yeah, exactly. And it's really sad, because yeah, I really, really wanted to root for Arthur, but with the context of the epilogues and how this is connected to the overarching story, it's like, no! No! Yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, <laughs> feels bad. It's like a foregone conclusion at this point, basically, which kind of makes it hard to root for him. I will say, what theories do you have about this story? Because it's very mysterious, and I got a lot of mixed signals from it lore-wise, which I'm going to check out now. Oh, this, I forgot to... Yeah, this is a story that is meant to explain the games more than anything, because William Afton doesn't have a massive role in the Fazbear Fright story as a whole. No, he has a he does pretty not. big one, but is not like huge so this is a story that is more so meant to explain the games than anything else and i think this uh falls into how single file timeline and the games could still work uh mm. obviously like there's a lot of problems with it and a lot of plot holes but this explains how glitch trap could even come to be essentially where after ucn um like let's say he's still alive, basically, uh, while UCN is happening. Uh, oh is him. yeah, I and then this. he ends up corrupting the circuit board, and where would that be? Probably a Fazbear Entertainment facility of some sort. So, it's kind of the story of how UCN leads to help wanted. I feel like there's a few things that are different, probably, but it's so similar, like it's impossible to ignore. Yeah, I was looking at this today, and I've concluded that. I mean, like, personal bias aside, even if you go along with the theory that this is somehow tying UCN to Help Wanted and ignoring that, you shouldn't need to read some obscure story to understand the plot of the games. They, there's still yeah. holes. It just doesn't make sense. And it's a shame, because they had an opportunity. Like, they could have actually explained it. But, like, the thing is, right, when I was rereading this, I thought the man in room 1280 is William Afton in the Fright story. But he has way more in common with Mike than William because, I mean, the thing about William is that he's not alive. He's undead. He is not breathing and, like, his heart isn't pumping blood in Springtrap. There's just no way. He's, I mean... Okay, so there's no... here's the thing real quick. Yeah. Um, so, Ethan, of all people, was actually talking to me no. about this a while ago. No way! Ethan coming so... in clutch with the Law Keeper! <laughs> By accident, yeah. So, we were Amazing. talking about FNAF 6, uh, because uh, I was recording guides for it at the time. We were talking about the salvage, uh, and I asked him, Hey, what's the sound cue for this? Because all the animatronics have, like, sound cues when they're about oh, to attack. Shit, yeah. So, I asked him, what's Afton's sound cue? And he goes, strangely enough, it's actually a heart beating. So, we talked about this, and we think that, um, like, Afton's heart is still beating. There's not a lot of ways to deny it. So he is somehow, in some capacity, still alive within Springtrap. That's so weird. I, I, I knew people thought how, it was a heartbeat, but, yeah. but I, I was, is it, like, confirmed by the game files? Because, like, I, I wasn't sure if it was a heartbeat. It's a heartbeat, for sure. It's yeah, confirmed. Like, I've listened to it. I've what? listened to the sound cube, like, isolated, like, over and over. It's clear as day it's a heartbeat. Dude. So, Afton's alive somehow. Like... Don't know how, but yeah, he is. So that that I mean, that could still sense. link it to the man in room twelve eighty. There's a lot that of better does. Holes, but it the, okay, sense. The, the, the thing that stuck out to me is that the man in room twelve eighty doesn't have any signs of um, spring lock wounds, like the hole punctures, and also there's the yeah. smell of smoldering plastic and scorched like metal, which I picked up on. But it's like there's no sign of him having been in a suit. So it's like, what happened? You know, previously, and I know the the epilogues mention a fire, the, a mysterious fire that happened, but it's like, if he was spring trap, why is there no sign of the suit? There's so many questions, because it's like, the government apparently had custody of him for a few years, and they took him off life support. Did they, like, take the suit off? Um, and, you know, then, like, the whole vengeful spirit thing. What Again, I was thinking, okay, so we know from the logbook that uh, Mike has been having horrific nightmares, 
um, and there could be another soul inside his brain, you know, after being, like, you know, scooped, and after End had left. It's, it's, a, it's really complicated, but my, my thought process was this. Okay, so, Mike's brother is on his deathbed. William says, I will put you back together. He dies, he takes Evan, let's call him Evan. I don't know if that's his name, but I don't really care anymore. He takes Evan's remnant, he puts it in the scooper with, like, the MCI and all of that stuff, right? That ends up in the Funtime animatronics, doesn't really matter which ones, some people say like Funtime Freddy or something, whatever, maybe. Uh, and then it ends up in Ennard. And then after Ennard leaves Mike's body, uh, his brother's self decides to stay with Mike instead, which is why uh, Golden Freddy says like, it's me and FNAF 1, and you've got like, um, their name and stuff in the logbook. It still doesn't fully make sense to me, um, but like... If UCN, if this is supposed to be a parallel to UCN, and UCN's actually having it inside William Afton's living, breathing brain after being burned in Pizza Sim and not FNAF 3, how did how did the Vengeful Spirit get inside Afton's brain? How, how does that work? Because... Yeah, it, it is pretty strange. We do know... Here's the thing, so... I, I just think it's not been explained properly. Stated. I could definitely, like, figure it out with uh, a bit of research. I can't remember where it was yeah. stated, but Cassidy was in the FNAF 6 building at the time of the fire. Yeah. It's weird, because so... Go Golden Freddy was nowhere to be seen, but I feel like they were there in secret. They have to have been for UCN to happen. Yeah. So Cassidy was there, like, during the uh, during the FNAF 6 fire, and I believe actually tethered William to life, like, while the fire was happening, preventing the fire from killing him. Hmm. Um, oh yeah, and I had another of, theory. Followed them into, the, followed them into the hospital essentially, kept tormenting him with UCN. Like the man in room twelve eighty, yeah. some version of it has to happen in the game universe. Yeah, it's weird. I just can't make sense of it because, I mean, after Peterson being burned, like who would come to rescue Afton? I mean, I guess the fire service would notice the fire and and you know they check it out, but like. What about everyone else? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that reminds it's me. The ending. The ending uh, might explain this, but it's still really weird. Uh, the man in room 1280 explodes. His body just starts mm -hmm. convulsing. It explodes. And then something leaves it. Uh, Arthur sees a void of, like, what I think is, like, an agony blob or something. And then there's footsteps and footprints leading somewhere into the distribution center. <laughs> and I was like, I wasn't even sure if um, Afton was communicating any of the time with like the finger movements or if it was just the vengeful spirit the whole time. Because there's this ghostly kid who I think is the same thing, Andrew, in the Fright Story. Uh, Cat, who, like, or Cassidy, parallel. Yeah, who has like an alligator mask and he's keeping Afton alive to punish him and he can't remember why. Because we get more of that in the epilogues later. It's honestly, it might just be that it's so all over the place. I haven't put the pieces together, but like, I cannot make sense of it. Yeah, we, we can talk about this like a lot later we need in to. DMs or voice chat or whatever. Because there, I mean, there's so much like more stuff that we have to unpack with uh, right. theories and stuff that we can figure out. Mm. Um... But like this so, could actually yeah, explain like, yeah. how the Steel Wool games are after UCN. But I don't even like that. That's the sad thing. I don't even like that as a plot point. But uh, yeah. it is what it is. We, I don't get to decide what's canon. Got some of the plot holes, I think. But yeah, so the Man in Rune Twelve Eighty mm. probably the most lore relevant. Like, and if we're talking lore relevance, it's got to have the most lore relevance out of probably, any story yeah. series. Probably, like Fetch was pretty high, but I've actually put this one higher. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely say it's got the most lore relevance out of anything. Um, but yeah, as a story, like, I don't know. I just, I don't like Arthur that much as a protagonist. Maya isn't that well developed either. Strangely yeah. enough, the nurses are the most well developed. I think the theme of morality, however, is very interesting. I think it just could have been executed better. So yeah, it's weird because this story is anything but average. But I would say it's an average Fazbear Fright story in terms it's of how weird. good it is. It's just, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. I have, to, I agree. That's that's the page I'm on. But yeah, uh, ironic that you say that about Heartless. But yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about like the lore stuff and like. This how just this, this completely the, changes the everything we know about Springtrap. If he's still somehow alive in that suit, I mean, okay, I, I can ignore the details because Scott, you know, anatomy. We saw Scratchtrap. I guess we didn't technically see him die in the FNAF 3 mini games. But like, from what we know of the novels, like, yeah, how well, would he get hear, like in Fab Three? You can hear him like walking around and like moaning and like wheezing and all that. 
there has to be a paranormal explanation. Because it's like, how is he being kept alive in the first place? He doesn't have access to food or water or whatever, like... Mm -hmm. I guess it just is. If Agony can manifest an entire duplicate of Chica that can come stalk Susie's house every night for like a year... I don't know. Oh, not a year, like three nights. I guess, but it's been... I thought it was going on for the whole year, because it's a year after Susie's death. Maybe not the whole time. Doesn't seem like it. I don't know. I'll have to reread that story because there's there's definitely a lot of strange stuff in it. Yeah, I think I think I don't think we see the first time it happens, but it might not be going the whole time. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not gonna dwell on this, guys, because this is getting into some deep lore that I don't have a grasp on yet. <laughs> it's just yeah, so all over the place. We knew this was gonna happen probably when we got to the man in the lady, but it's probably best just to move on. The you Black gotta love the mysteries though. This possibilities. Anyway, yeah, right. I don't know. I, I'm still but, very much engaged. Like. I'm still very much engaged in FNAF lore, even after Security Breach. Like, I know you oh, aren't man. as much, but I yeah. still feel like there's plenty of interesting stuff to talk about and plenty of there interesting is, there uh, is. things to make. I, I just want to really, like, get my head around Fazbear Frights. I don't know if I'm going to do anything huge after that. This is a different topic, guys, but, like... I'm definitely not looking into Security Breach for lore. I'm guessing those notes scattered throughout the Pizzaplex are probably going to link with Tales from the Pizzaplex. So I'll probably give it a look in, but I don't know. I just don't know yet. I just I just want Tales from the Pizza Flex to come out at this point, because I really want Security Breach's lore to be redeemed somehow. Yeah. I feel like Tales from the Pizza Flex, the entire reason for it to exist is to explain more about Security Breach. Hopefully. I guess it's better than nothing, even if it has to rely on the books. Alright. Blackbird. Blackbird is not an F. Blackbird. I was just watching a recap of that today, because I was really rusty on this one. And I have mixed feelings so, about it because it's good, but when I first read it, it marked the start of the end for me. When I read this, all that I can remember thinking is that it's just like 1.35am again, and it's like barely even connected to FNAF, because the Blackbird is just this thing that's invented by the characters in the story, it's not even like, it's vaguely inspired by Chica, but that's it. But like, the psychological yeah. horror well, I, I remember and the Freddy's conflict? It's, it's mentioned, it's like, uh, I reread it, uh, I watched the video, so like, Noel and Sam are making a horror movie for their school, guys, okay, they're making like a short movie for a college university project, and they decide to take inspiration from Freddy Fazbear's, because there's a lot of like, urban myths about that, again, it's like FNAF 3, going around the entire time, and they invent something called the Blackbird, which stalks people who are like, um, guilty, basically, um, uh, and like makes them like confess their sins kind of thing, which is you know, you can see where that's going. That kind of happens uh, Man, I can't remember exactly what happens, but yeah, it's um Noel basically gets haunted when he thinks Sam has like died or gone missing By the blackbird because Sam was like wearing the blackbird suit for the movie and it's like, you know, pretty symbolic and uh, the tension's really good, and the, the the conflict is really good. Noel basically goes back to find someone that he used to bully when he was like way younger, uh, and apologize to her. And yeah, it's it's really nicely written. I think the characters are pretty good in this one, but it's been ages since I actually read it, so I definitely need to reread it. Let me give it a B. Yeah. I'm not sure. So I actually really like Blackbird. Um, there's a lot of like the thing I like about it. There's a lot of different ways it can go depending yeah. on your interpretation. Overall, oh, yeah. it seems to be, it seems to be the Man in Room 1280s topic of morality, but done well. Like yeah, better definitely done better. to the point. There's so many interpret. Like let's just list some of the interpretations I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, the Blackbird is a manifestation of Noel's guilty conscience. It's Sam playing a prank on him. Is yep. Sam's emotional energy coming back to get revenge on Noel while he's unconscious? Like, there's so many possible different ways it can go. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting. Like, That's I just, good kind like, of I think that Noel, I think that Noel and Sam and Amp, like especially Noel and Sam, but also Amber a little bit, are like just very well set up as characters, and I really like it. I really like how um, Noel is yet again another flawed protagonist, where he's not necessarily a bad person, but the entire story is about him atoning for past actions. Um, I think I think it's just great. I like the multiple interpretations. It's a pretty scary story. Uh, it's another story, kind of like Bunny Call, not quite in the same level, but I think that 
uh, it's interesting to think about because we don't know what the Blackbird would have done had it actually gotten to Noel. Like, let's say Noel right. is a complete jerk, basically, who says, no, I'm not going to atone for my actions, you know, like, whatever. He doesn't do anything to try to fix it. What would Blackbird have actually done? Because we it's kind of like small bits and pieces. Yeah, it is like Buddycore, because it's a good ending where you, you don't know what would have happened. But it's like, the mystery yeah. isn't just, you know, completely artificial. It's like you said, there's so many different interpretations, which I hadn't even thought about, that it like it actually really gets you thinking in a psychological way. You know, the thing is, yeah. when I first read this, this is when I started noticing that Fazbear Frights was becoming tropey and formulaic, and the stories were very much getting, like, too similar. Um... But I feel like dragging it down because it's too similar to previous stories isn't really fair when it does the same concept better. So I'm actually going to move up to an A rank. I think that's yeah, a fair assessment. Um, I can see what you mean about it being kind of similar to other stories like 1.35am. Yeah. But I feel it's like not that as connection... Opinion, but... Yeah, I feel like that connection... Yeah, it's not as good as 1.35am in my opinion, but it's still like incredibly good. Um, it's... The thing is, like... I feel like that connection is very much surface level in a way where it looks the same on the surface when you look at it, where it's psychological horror, where the protagonist is stalked throughout the night by some invisible entity, uh, constantly tormented, you know, like, it very much seems like a 135 connection, uh, on the surface level, but then you look at the theme of the story and it's actually really different, where it's more about guilty conscience and yeah. atonement and, uh, the consequences of past actions. And things like that. 135 AM wasn't about any of that. It was just about um, like psychological horror done incredibly well, where an innocent person is tormented. That's yeah, not it was really kind of like Delilah clinging onto her past too much because like she chooses to get mm -hmm. Ella to kind of replace the child she never had and kind of not, I guess, like moving on. Um, but she's much more innocent. It's not like she's really done something wrong. Though. Right. And the guilt factor yeah, of Bunny Call was like a minor thing. This is like central. Yeah, Noel is kind of the opposite of Delilah in a lot of ways, where he's trying to move on from his past, uh, mm. as opposed to holding on to it. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it's just very interesting. I feel like the connection to 1.35am, uh, because other stories in Fast Birth Rights have been too similar to past ones, but I feel like the connection of that is surface level and, like, borderline intentional, almost, so I maybe, really don't maybe. think it drags it down very much. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just a story focused on a very interesting premise, um... And, the, like, the characters are well-developed, I think. And like Bunny Call, it's really interesting to think about what would have happened if uh, things turned out differently. Definitely. And one more thing also that's interesting to think about is how this story would have turned out very differently if it weren't for the epilogue. So, epilogue 10. Yeah. We see Larson travel to the scene of Blackbird and see Sam in the Blackbird costume walking on the train tracks. And he actually somehow manages to push him out of the way and into the ditch and save his life. So, yeah. that's what happened in Blackbird. We now know exactly how that happened. Uh, but Which it's is crazy. But it's kind of interesting yeah. that this is the only story directly influenced through the epilogues. Yeah, that whole thing was weird. Like, because that was, like, actual, like, time travel. Or, like, I don't know how that works. But, like, it's, you know, it's like, it's like last one was just taken to a different place in time. Um, and, you know, able to actually affect events. I'm, I'm not going to try and explain I think this, that. But, yeah. I think this ties back to emotion, to powerful emotional energy again. Right. Because he'd spent the entirety of Epilogue 10 wishing that he could help other people. Like, he sees what happens to Delilah, he sees what happens to Pete, and he's powerful mm. to stop it the entire time. So when Blackbird rolls around, he really, really wants to do something about it, and somehow is actually able to in some small way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That, right. Yeah, it's definitely yeah, that. It's, it's a very very interesting story i think good characters great setup uh not quite as good psychological horror as 135 am but overall still just an incredibly solid yeah. story i think that um it, it's actually quite a bit underrated i think uh you're probably right about that i think uh if it was i think my only issues with it are that like it's not really a fnaf story it's a great story but it, like i if this wasn't labeled five nights at freddy's i would have no idea that it was until they have that one mention of like freddy's it's just kind of I don't know. That's kind of true. But uh, other than that, and maybe being too similar to other stories, I don't think that's that's not the fault of Blackbird. That's the fault of all the stories that are similar to each other. So yeah, I'm giving it an A rank. Like you, you've actually convinced me it's a lot better than I thought it was first reading. So that's good because it is underrated. Which yeah. brings us right. uh, to the real, yeah. the real Jake. The real Jake. 
the volume yeah, six cool. is actually my favorite book because I think all three stories are great. Um, yeah, this fair is enough. another story this... that I feel like it's similar to Coming Home, but not in exactly the same way. No. Um, this is a story that is fully rooted in reality, and I think it's the first one that really is. Mm. And There's like the no mention of Freddy's, Freddy's, but I think it works for that. It's an exception, I'd say. Yeah, it's not a scary story, but it's a very emotional one, and it's able to stand on its own without being connected to Freddy's, really. Um, and it's just... Yeah, I don't know. It's a really nice story. I really like it, because it's the first one fully rooted in reality and still works because of it. Mm. Yeah, it's just like... Obviously, it's setting up Jake from the epilogues. But it's fascinating yeah, exactly. because it's just such a unique story. Um... Because of it, if it wasn't tied to the epilogues, I'd definitely critique it for not being connected to FNAF. But like this one was so good, I think I can overlook that because the this characters so, are all yeah, like so really grounded in the. This is so grounded in setting up the epilogues while also mm. being grounded in reality that I think it's, I think it's really interesting. Like, right, I it's agree tragically it realistic. Yeah, if it wasn't connected to the epilogues, I'd say well, like obviously it's way better writing than In the Flesh, but I'd kind of say it's yeah. It would be kind of similar in the flesh in the way it doesn't really have a reason to exist, but because exactly. it's so heavily connected to the epilogues and the other stories, uh, I think it, like, yeah, like, they did a great job on it. Th like, this reinforms Jake's whole character, guys. Basically, for those of you who don't remember or don't know, uh, Jake has cancer. He is dying, and this little kid, Jake, he's, like, he's, like, 10, and he's just, like, stuck in his bedroom 24-7, basically. Uh, there's a woman looking after him. I forget her name. Marjorie. It was... Hang on a second. That's not the Wait. same Marjorie from Bunny Call. Hold on a second. Are you sure? No, no. Hold on. What? I'm going to double check the name. Give You're joking me. You're joking. There's no way. I know that, like, some names randomly crop up multiple times. It's, um... Her name's Margie. Okay. Margie. Thank God. I was like, no, don't do this to <laughs> us, please. <laughs> it's yeah, no, She's completely... Say... No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she appears in Epilogue 2 also. Like, she does. Larson she goes does, to Jake's yeah. house and finds her. And it's really interesting to me how this story was planned from so early on, mm. even though originally only five books were planned in Fazbear Right. Frights. Yeah. The I don't know how all that works. But yeah. Like, when people start mentioning, oh, yeah, it's from Epilogue 2, I was like, what? I had to reread it because I made no connection. I completely forgot about it. It's amazing how that works. But, yeah. yeah. So, basically, every night, there's a doll in the closet that talks to Jake. And it's like, um, they make up, like, fake memories of Jake living a normal life. Uh, and the doll, uh, like, in the closet, it's like, um, once you're able to walk over to here, like, to me, then you can, like, open the closet. And it's like, it, the doll is the real Jake. Uh ironic because it's the fake jake but fake jake that rhymes yeah. But, but yeah yeah and here's um, here's the other thing i like about the story so with how it's set up initially you think it's going to be another scary story right where simon turns out to be some malevolent entity basically that's somehow being mm -hmm. controlled by paranormal energy yeah but it turns out that's actually not the case um simon is being controlled by jake's dad evan who is a soldier basically um who and he's away from home there hence margie yeah, but he's, yeah. like, still talking to him every night, taking on this persona of the doll, and is trying to uh, make him happier. And it's, uh, it's like, a really sweet story that you never would expect, because this plot right? just only comes in later, where we figure out that it's Evan doing this, and it's really, yeah. like, it's a really interesting twist on the typical Fazbear Frights formula. It completely turns everything on its head, because it's, like, literally the opposite of everything else Fazbear Frights had been, which was awesome. It was really cool, and, um... Yeah, and it, it's like, uh, it obviously ties into the overall Fright story as well, because obviously, um, the thing that's emphasized repeatedly, like, with this doll that Margie, like, paints and draws on to fit all these, like, fake, you know, like, memories of the real Jake, um, that he's living, you know, in, in his mind, is, uh, okay, so, like, uh, Jake dies, right, Jake and Evan both die, which is uh, tragic, but also ties in Deathlock 2 quite nicely, because Larson actually asked himself, it's like, you know, so wait, which died, the the the, bo the man or the, the boy? And it's like, yeah, Evan dies fighting, and Jake dies of the cancer, and it's incredibly tragic for uh, Margie. But what happens is that um, 
the at the end the closet doors are open and the doll is gone and the implication is that as a ghost Jake walked over went to the real Jake doll that you know Simon Evan had you know been talking about and went and like possessed him yeah which so is why finally, he ends up in the stitch race to walk over the closet Mm. So he sees Simon, he becomes one with Simon, and then yeah. the Stitch Wraith is created yeah. by Phineas Taggart later using the head of the Simon doll. As well as a bunch which of other things, Jake including is Fetch. Which, but yes. yeah. oh, which explains a lot, actually, about how, because we see how Jake and Andrew control the Stitch Wraith. Jake is the one who's able to see. He's basically the head, the face. And yeah. Andrew is the one, like, under him, basically, deeper inside. This actually connects very well, because Jake is presumably possessing the Simon doll. Which makes sense because the head of the Simon doll is put on the Stitch Wraith, so of course Jake would be controlling the head. Whereas the battery pack is put lower on the Stitch Wraith, which Andrew was possessing or corrupting Fetch somehow, so it makes sense yeah. how Andrew would possess that. It's really it's interesting also, detail. Yeah, it's great. Great attention to detail. It's a very emotional, powerful story, and the way it connects with the epilogues is awesome. And it's just so different to everything else. It somehow manages, for me, to be an S rank. Despite being completely different, agree. it's just I, so good. I would actually agree with that. Yeah. That might be a bit much, but I don't know, like, I, it's the real Jake, guys. I mean, this is huge. Like, it's just a good story. Yeah. That's all that matters. The characters just, are consistent. Yeah. And, yeah. Balances everything really well, uh, turns the formula completely on its head and does it well, so I'd very much agree. Uh, I think it is actually in this rank, yeah. Yeah. All right, that leaves Hide and Seek. So, Hide and Seek was the third story in Volume 6. Uh, the th something which I always found a bit weird with, uh, Fazbear Frights was some of the choices of the arrangement of the stories. I feel like a lot of the volumes, especially the later ones, would have sold better if different stories were on the front cover because they would have had familiar characters. Because Hide and Seek finally gives Shadow Bonnie, of all characters, their own story. Uh, and kind of explains, yep. finally, what Shadow Bonnie and probably by extension Shadow Freddy, like, actually are. It would- I- they would have- like, I love Blackbird, but- if Shadow Bonnie be on the cover, I would have been more interested. Same with like, yeah. um, you know, Gumdrop say, Angel. Like, if it been either of the from other two, everything I've good. seen, I think that Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy have like very different uh, reasons for existing. But that's really? a topic for that's a topic for a later day. Um, right. Hide and Seek is an interesting story. This is another one that like why I think Volume Six is my favorite book is because I think this story is once again a overall very solid story. Mm. Um, the protagonist is very interesting. So, I think I've told you this before. This story is personal to me because yeah. the protagonist is, like, uncannily similar to me. Or at least, wow. like, a past version of me, essentially. Wow. Uh, so it, I it's honestly like, can't it's remember this story, story very well. I actually don't remember much about it. I just remember there's this angry kid, and he has an older brother and a dad who, like, heavily resent him, and he, like... Something to do with an arcade yeah, machine? His, I can't remember. I actually don't remember. His entire much of this. personality basically uh, re like revolves around competition, basically. Oh yeah, he's always second to his brother, more. and it's like super resentful. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was quite so a good dynamic. He competes. Yeah, he competes with his brother Connor, and basically like every aspect of uh, and every aspect of their life, basically from even the time that they were young children. Yeah. So, Connor, who used to work at Freddy's, also basically is the high score on every arcade machine there. Uh, so, a new game comes out, which is Hide and Seek, which features Shadow Bonnie, and Toby decides, okay, I'm going to beat him at this Toby game like, before he even finds out that it exists. So, yep. he tries to get a high score on the game, and he just can't, because the game seems rigged, essentially. So, yeah. he ends up getting frustrated and smashing up, like, the entire uh, setup, like, the entire oh, room yeah, that the arcade is in. And that ends up releasing Shadow Bonnie to haunt him. And that gets worse and worse. Bit of psychological horror in the vein of Blackbird or 1.35am. It's like on his back and it grows and it morphs. It starts off something like the, the Shadow Bonnie we saw in FNAF 2. But then it has like nightmare teeth and it gets like bigger. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, Shadow Bonnie is a pretty interesting villain just because the fact that it lives within Toby essentially and that he's running out of time. And it's so, like an expression of tried. his own, you know, kind of like yeah. anger. Because again, the, it, each it volume has a off theme. Of his agony. Yeah. Like on the back of each volume, when it's talking about the blurb, um, it starts off with a one-liner that basically sums up the theme. And for volume five, it says like, "When left in darkness, rage festers." So, like rage was apparently the theme of volume five. Though I don't know how consistently mm -hmm. they really got that across. 
I can't remember what it was with Volume 6. I think it was something about control, maybe? Um, uh, no, that was Volume 2, actually. Uh, um, okay. Volume 6 was the consequences of past actions, I think. Interesting. Consequences is, is a huge thing of yeah. FNAF. I, I, don't think that, I don't think that's something to take too seriously, because that kind of, they could apply it to a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. What, like, what actually connects um, these three stories? Blackbird, Real, Jake, Hide and Seek. Consequences? I can see Blackbird and Hide and Seek. Like, yeah. I can see those being pretty similar, Definitely. but the Real Jake is different. Yeah, no, okay. I, don't, I think, I don't know. I don't know who wrote that, but yeah. Okay, whatever. Hide and seek. Um, okay, I actually don't remember yeah. much of this, so I'm going to take your word for it. I think I'd probably give it a B or a C. I think it's, I don't know. It doesn't stand out yeah, to me, but I don't think it's bad. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so, here's the thing that does stand out about this to me. So, the ending is that Toby goes to the arcade machine. Uh, yeah. He finally figures out what he needs to do, and that's to basically give up, like quit out of the game and admit defeat, and then Shadow Bonnie will stop haunting him. And he just knows this, like for a yeah. fact. Um, so what he ends up doing is he goes up to the arcade machine and he's about to quit, and then he decides that he can't do it. And he turns around and rams his back on pegs against the wall. And then uh, as yes. he's dying, then he basically says, I win. So, this is interesting because he like impales himself the only to story. kill Shadow Bonnie. Yeah, the protagonist. Mm. This could have been a good ending. The protagonist has no one to blame other than himself for this not being a good ending. He decides that like his uh, pride is more important than his survival, essentially. Yeah, I don't know. He was. I won't offend you, but I didn't like him that much. <laughs> he yeah, was a bit of yeah, a dick. Don't worry. That, uh, but he had a really basically... rough upbringing, so like I get it. Like his his yeah. his family was even worse. Yeah, when I, I say remember that, like, Toby is similar to me, I mean, like, an exaggerated version of, uh, like, my personality, how definitely, I felt about definitely. competition and stuff, like, uh, 2020, basically. Fair enough. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, I don't know, I find Toby a really interesting character by how he progresses, because toward the end of the story, also, his ultra-competitive brother, who's essentially bullying him, which is Connor, uh yeah. like sees how it's affecting him basically like how he's not getting any sleep oh yeah i forgot and, about this and he, yeah and connor actually like tells him hey like we need to stop this like if it's affecting you this bad like you win you know and it's interesting because yeah. connor has been like the jerk throughout this entire story but he actually ends up being a more uh, mature character than toby is yeah i remember reading that actually and it felt a bit sudden like i don't know i feel like connor could have been written better Toby was pretty in depth, though, I guess, because he's a protagonist, he got a lot of the spotlight. Um, yeah, anyways, I don't know. I, 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 I still feel like Connor's time. written uh, written pretty well as a character. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's bad. it's actually it's actually really interesting, like how he ends up being uh, the more the more mature one there, basically, and how everything mm. in the story seemed to be setting up for a good ending until the very last second when Toby just decides that he can't do it. So that's what makes the story stand out for me. I think. Yeah, no, um, credit was just unique. It's it's not like fantastic writing, but I think it's very interesting how the characters are set up. It's very unique. Um, mm -hmm. I really can't say it's a bad story. Like on my own tier list, I think I ranked it pretty high. Yeah, fellas, I think that's all the time we've got for today. Okay, hold on. Pretty much, like Keyboard. unless you want to do like a few of the epilogues, then I think we're pretty we much out. Why can't I switch tab? Thank you. Okay, we've been going for two and a half hours. We could do uh, epilogues one to six now if you want, or we could do the epilogues in like a third stream, but that might be a bit much. I don't know. Might be, might be a bit much. I think we can do I one through six do. now. As yeah. Long as Let's do it, like, quickly look quick. at the epilogues. All right. So we're gonna take account of the epilogues. Let me just duplicate those. Uh, yeah. So we have to reset this. Uh, oh wait, I just realized the, uh, whatever, it does, it's fine. Alright, epilogues. Epilogues are in their own category, alright. So the epilogues, guys, obviously at the end of each, uh, volume, there are stingers. The stitch rate stingers, epilogues, whatever you want to call them. Little chapters of, like, a running story that goes throughout the whole Frights universe, kind of connects everything. Um, alright. Let's go through this. Epilogue 1. Hmm. Epilogue 1, 
we're introduced to Detective Larson, so we finally have a police investigation yep. story, which is really cool. Something that FNAF has needed for a while, I think. My, uh, That's my true. girlfriend yeah, Lucy's I like been that. that. I like that premise of having mm. like a police investigation story surrounding uh, one of the deaths. Uh, it references to be beautiful in a really nice way, so you can tell, like, oh, wait, this is all connected. Uh, and it introduces the Stitch yeah. Wraith as well as this mysterious masked hooded figure that's, like, really creepy. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I think. I'm going to put it in A. I just think it introduces Larson and the Stitch Wraith quite, quite nicely. Obviously not the Stitch Wraith as we know it later on, but, like, his perspective on everything and kind of just um, his situation as well with his, like, son and his wife. I, I like Larson. Like, I don't know. He's a good protagonist. Like, he has a very clear and simple, um, like, conflict and traits, I think, but I think they work really well. Um, yeah, I like, for the I like how, uh, I like how Larson is set up. I think he's a good choice to, uh, to have as the protagonist of the Fazbear Frights, uh, epilogues, like this entire overarching story. Uh, I think he's a really good choice to, uh, have as the protagonist of that overall. The police investigation dynamic, really cool. I haven't seen it much before. I'm surprised there's not more fan games uh, on that kind of topic because I think yeah. it's very, uh, very interesting in like an area of FNAF that we haven't really seen before. Again, like with the and... families being impacted by the MCI, like realistically, like the police is going to have to have some kind of response to all of this. How does that work? I'm actually going to right. get summaries for these because I, I get some of the stingers mixed up. I don't want to make sure I'm talking about the right ones. But yeah, this is what happens in Stinger 1, basically. It's, you know... Larson's given the Stitch Wraith case, no one wants it because it's like, you know, considered urban legend. Some people don't believe it. It's like really creepy, intimidating. Good good setup. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's there. It's a good uh, standard, I think. Stinger number two follows yeah. homeless man and former professor Grimm watching. Oh, yeah. It's when uh, the Stitch Wraith is picking up the remains of the plush trap chaser. And there's this homeless dude watching him. And then there's also yeah. Larson investigating Margie's home after the events of real jake oh my god now i'm realizing how that all connects now i'm like oh man i think epilogue 2 is an s rank to be honest just for the tie-ins yeah but, um, epilogue 2 report. like it's not bad by any means but it's never been one of my favorites at all um Let me do just this, the fact here's the thing that kind of like drags it down for me Grim doesn't matter in the overall context of the story. He Shit, never yeah. shows up again. There's this theory I have about him maybe being in Blackbird as like a minor character, um, but he never shows up again. He's never important, and it's really weird that they just feature him here instead of like when I have Larson in his place, like seeing the Stitch Ray pick up the parts somehow. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. Um, the thing I do like about it, I like how it immediately takes place after Out of Stock, so you, like, you know, both um, in order of release and in order of timeline, so you can immediately tell, oh, this, like, just happened. This is connected. Yeah. Um, it's really nice. I like that setup. And then the fact that Margie appears also, the one good thing that I can say about this epilogue, because I don't like much else about it, but I really do like how they reference a future story. Like, it's That's so amazing. cool. It's so cool. I like how Margie appears at the end of the epilogue and all that. Um, but I don't like the fact that they included Grimm here for no reason, since he doesn't do anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, just, I don't like the fact they included Grimm. Uh, yeah, Grimm's a bit weird, because I forgot thing. about him. And it looks like the Yeah, the out of stock thing is interesting, um, but really the only like part that I can look to to say, yeah, this is awesome, is how like they introduced Margie in yeah. reference to real Jake. That's about it. Oh, yeah. Actually, in that case, I think uh, we'll give it a B. Because it does gradually show um, the Stitch Wraith's kind of like motive and like what their gig is by picking up the pieces we don't know yet. And, but yeah, I, I agree with everything else you said. I'm actually looking for references to Grimm in the Stingers. So, in Stinger, like, 5, um, he follows the Stitch Wraith, there's, like, and he's, like, uh, there's just some, like, reference to him again. The last reference of Grimm, which I don't remember, I thought was that, but it mentions on the wiki, excuse me, this might be, this might be wrong, but it mentions on the wiki that the sleeping homeless man that Jake touches and, like, puts, like, a happy memory into in, like, epilogue, like, 8 or something, apparently that's Grimm. It says presumably grim, but we don't actually know. Actually interesting. I'd like forgotten about that. Huh. Yeah, I, if okay. that is grim, I feel that would kind of round him out because then it's like 
Jake, uh, you know, goes into his memories and, like, pulls out the happy one, because that's something that the spirits seem to do, be able to do, manipulate memories and stuff. Um, and this is, like, after the after amalgamation, all of that. So, I, I get, it's just weird. I feel yeah. like he could have had more closure, I, mean, though, I agree. That's Maybe cool that's that he, weird. Yeah, like, that's cool that he appears again at some point in the epilogues, but, again, he doesn't do anything, really. Mm. Like, he's, he's already relevant. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't really make sense. He doesn't contribute to the plot. Oh, yeah. well. All right. Epilogue number three. Uh, All right. I'm, I need to. I need to remind myself of what exactly happens in which one because I forget. Oh my god, my. This mouth is broken. a past slash present thing. Uh, it focuses on Taggart's creation of the Stitch Wraith uh, oh! in the past. Oh. Oh yeah. Here we go. This is where it gets good. Epilogue three. At the time, I was like, "This is the fattest law dump FNAF has ever <laughs> pumped out of its." Uh, pipe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Uh, you know. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> seriously. <kind of laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Right. I love Taggart. Um, because he's he's just an interesting character. He's very unique. He's kind of sociopathic. He's not malicious, but he's like really weird. And we have this whole explanation of the study of the power of human emotions, which is like connected to like intention and fetch and like all of that and then there's obviously where the stitch wraith is born which is huge you got the battery pack of fetch uh the head of the simon doll the you know freddy's endoskeleton and all these other haunted items that come together and then boom stitch wraith kills him leaves and there uh, phineas is electrocuted to death there's a mystery they never find out oh man I, this might be a bit generous but i want to give it an s rank just because like that was so hype reading that for the first time i mean i don't know i thought it was Exciting part it's, of the story. It's very well done. Uh, I wish they did a bit more of Taggart's character, like in that Fair. epilogue. Yeah, I they think did kill him really off cool. early. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is where the Stitch Wraith is easily at its most intimidating. This is like right before we start to find out that the Stitch Wraith is actually, like, you know, has honorable intentions for the most part. Yeah. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. And the thing is super intimidating here. Right? Like, I remember some people being disappointed that the Stitch Wraith is just, like, these two kids, and one of them's kind of angry, and the other's, like, really, like, you know, good, rather than some mm -hmm. intimidating monster, but, well, it was, like, We've you had know... enough intimidating monsters in FNAF, I think. It's yeah. good that this is, like, a more puppet-like figure, but I think it's the fact that it has its intimidating moments, I think, scratches that itch for a lot of people. Exactly, yeah. I think it, it balances the two, quite literally, by having two different characters inhibit it. Uh, which comes on to yeah. Stinger 4, which is where and I mean, we meet Jake and Andrew. Yeah, and like, I mean, I, hey, like, it's, I think it's implied that, like, William Afton is in there also, right? At yes, some point. so I think this is what was going with the man in room 1280. The man is William Afton, and Afton mm -hmm. managed to latch onto Andrew when he escaped into the distribution center, which is why everything is so hostile. Andrew is just an angry kid. Afton, uh, they, they made him a force of nature villain, but, uh, Whatever. Yeah, he's he's evil. That, that, that's it. Um, but yeah, it's like all connected up. Like this is this is theory, but it's pretty obvious once you once you put the pieces together. Like, uh... and it's cool because it's referencing again future stories which you don't know about yet, which means reading it first time and second time is yeah different. But uh, cool, yeah, we get the characters of Jake and Andrew. Yeah, references to past and future stories. Um... You know, check. Uh, Stitch Rafe is pretty intimidating, which is cool. Um, Taggart is a really interesting character. Uh, the past and present, like, thing that they set up is really interesting. I kind of wish they did that with another epilogue at some point. Um, yeah. I think overall, just, yeah, very solid epilogue and a pretty unique one, also. So, I'm just thinking now, because Sting is three, Sting of four, like, we just looked at kind of, you know, they do have that past present thing, but the later ones are very linear, actually. Yeah. But yeah, this is where, like, it's number four is where, like, um, you know, Andrew, like, accidentally, or after, I guess, like, kills someone, and Jake's like, what was that? And they, like, he digs into his memories, and he starts the mission to gather them all in one place. Oh, boy. But yeah, no, it's, it's really cool how they track down all the infected items, which is why in, you know, Stinger 2, the, the, the Stitch Wraith was picking the pieces of, like, the plush trap chaser. Let's call it that rounds out. I don't know. Number 5. What exactly? I'm just reminding you mean myself. 4? Oh, we just looked at We four. haven't done 4. Yeah. Oh, wait. Wait, no, that was 3 that we looked at with the creation of the Stitch Wraith. 
Oh yeah, but four four is just where like uh, Andrew and Jake are actually like talking to each other. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's like where it's revealed that uh, you know the Stitch Wraith is uh, actually his noble intentions and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was just character heavy. I think it's great, just because we get the characters like in depth before moving the plot. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Not much else to say about that one. Number five is That's where ah, yeah, uh, this is where Larson's really making progress with the investigation. Now he starts making connections between Fetch, Stitch Wraith, a mysterious fire, um, Afton, the MCI. Um, Grimm's back again. He's following the Stitch Wraith, and then he just leaves. Uh, I mean, yeah, things happen. Oh, and this is where Jake almost uh, sets himself free by latching onto a positive memory, but he yeah, forces like himself most... back. Mm. Yeah, that's like the most interesting part of this for me, is it says a lot about uh, Jake's character, where he decides that he's going to stay there for Andrew, essentially, uh, yeah. instead of... Because, I mean, you know, like, he can set himself free, he's just choosing not to, which is I'm being too really interesting to me, and kind of, kind of reinforces its ties back to the puppet, almost. Yeah, to me it seems like, uh, with, uh, Jake, it's like, it not only shows how exactly that kind of thing works, like, a soul needs to have, like, you know, like, finished business and, like, latch onto positive memories in order to be free, rather than, like, staying stuck with the negative ones, you know, agony and, and, and like, fear and hate and all that stuff, instead of, like, you know, love and... I yeah, think that's kind of tied back to Happiest about... Day explains a lot about the games from f3 why yes. it's called happiest day because they they like have to puppet has to bring everyone together and create this whole forced memory of the birthday party that you know golden freddy whichever one you know never had um and like that sets golden freddy that puts golden freddy to rest that allows them to like you know actually relax but here we're seeing the opposite jake knows that um if he leaves then he's gonna be abandoning andrew so he's staying because of a kind of noble responsibility which we've really we've not seen before it's kind of like the puppet but the puppet i think also had unfinished business and wouldn't have been able to set herself free anyway like charlotte i yeah. don't know I, I wouldn't really look to the novels for understanding the puppet as a character because charlie was so different and uh not the best written uh that i i don't know i just don't know about that because also she was a robot the whole time so like how is she even real the novel, know. yeah, the novel. We need are more of Puppet, straight. to be honest. We need more of Puppet. Because pretty I much, an yeah. Like just, in the books. just both in the novels and Fazbear Frights and all that, definitely, uh, definitely need more about that character. The I think, only appearance of the confusing. Puppet is a cameo in Stinger number six or seven, which seven, I of. believe. Yeah. So yeah. we're not going to go there today, guys. We're going to finish with Stinger number six. Again, they're a lot shorter, a lot simpler, but they go a lot deeper with the lore. So, six is like the setup, and seven is like the climax. Uh, I'm just remember. So, yeah. Larson arrives at the factory where the Stitch Wraith has gathered everything. He sees the Stitch Wraith, he sees all kinds of things. Um, he actually sees, like, the ghosts as, like, kind of, like, lights, like, floating kind of gas, gaseous kind of thing. It's really weird. It's interesting, though. And, uh, yeah, we see Andrew and Jake, like, you know, um... Like, taking control of the Stitch Wraith, because Andrew, like, is being hostile, but Jake doesn't want to hurt Larson. Um, and yeah, then they activate the machine, I think, to destroy everything, but that's when Afton finally plays his card and he reveals himself. Also, uh, the man in room 1280 shows up. I, f I completely forgot about that the man in room 1280 is just there. How is he there? Yeah. He explodes- wait, what? Hold on a sec, I don't remember, I need to reread this. <laughs> Yeah, I'll reread this too eventually. None of- I- I'm not gonna question it, but yeah, basically, everyone's here. Alright, Afton's here. Um, and then he kind of, uh... What? I need to reread this. There's some freaky stuff. Basically, he takes all of the mass of- Basically, all of the different things in the books, you know, Ella's in the pile, Fetch is in the pile, you know, you've probably got Foxy from, um you know, uh, Freddy's or whatever, you know, you've got, uh, yeah, you've sure, got Ralpho, sure. maybe, Blackbird, maybe not Blackbird, I don't know, but, like, you've got, like, yeah, all these Black, toys Black and animatronics, Bird, yeah. and, 
like things from the previous stories and the future story to it in there, you know, and they form together into this giant garbage body that Afton uh, inhabits. And yeah, it's it's really funky. So he's like this giant 15 foot tall trash monster now, and it's called the Afton Amalgamation. That's its canon name. That is the actual name of this thing. It's a pretty, I, I guess it's kind of generic as a concept, but I think it works. I think it works in the context of frights. Um, I like Larson's kind Larson of working out what's going really on. Well. Yeah. Yeah, I think Larson's set up pretty well in Epilogue 6. Yeah. Like, they go through, they have the perspective of all these different characters. Jake and Larson. I'm not sure if they actually have the perspective of the others, but like, we get a lot of dialogue between Jake and Andrew, and yeah, uh... Oh, I actually mentions, yeah, infected remnants of Foxy, Fetch, Ella, and the plush trap chaser, as well as all the other toys and objects infected by Andrew's agony. Not necessarily everything, like, I wouldn't say Blackbird, but, like, a lot of the stuff from here, like, you know, maybe, uh, Lucky Boy, you know, is here, maybe, uh, maybe some, some gumdrop that turns you into a, a gumdrop. Yeah, um... Yeah. But yeah, this this was pretty huge. Again, it's a very slow-paced story, um, but you know, I, I think like I think this part did the right thing, like um, by showing us like Afton's return. Again, it's weird because they build it up, but then he's like immediately defeated in the next like epilogue. I need to think about this. It's kind of hard to rank these. It's all I, I honestly I could rate the whole thing as one, but each epilogue I'm not sure because like each different epilogue is a different part that needs to do something different with a different purpose. That's true. It's it's kind of hard to make like a tier list of, um, of epilogues. Anyway, so yeah, uh, what's things. the list looking like so far? This is what I got. So I put three and four in S, five and six in A, one in B, two in C. I'm really not sure though. I feel like this might all be rearranged. What I'm gonna do, guys, I'm gonna come back to this, alright, next stream, I'm gonna come back to this, I'm gonna do all of, you know, the epilogues together, like, properly. Um, hopefully I can reread some stuff in that time as well. But, uh, yeah, um... I am, for now, I'm actually just gonna put all the epilogues in here. There we go. Yeah, I feel like, um, the ranking Not of the epilogues is gonna change a bit, uh, once we do part two. Um, I need to think like, epilogue 7, 10, 11, like, I think they're all really interesting. Right? Because it's like, the thing is, what's the standard, right? Like, the weakest one is probably, like, 7 or 8, maybe? But those were still pretty good. I'd say, I'd say the weakest one was either 2 or 9. I think 9. Yeah, actually, 9, 9 probably is the weakest one, yeah. But the strongest one, it's like, well, 5 and 6 were pretty epic, but 10 and 11. I'd say, I'd say 10 is the strongest. Mm, with yeah. like 11 and 7 being like pretty close so we've still got like a waste yeah we're gonna probably like encounter uh like a way better ones later on i think it's a lot of ways it could go but i think i'm gonna have to end this here guys because we've been going for almost like three hours now i mean it's gonna stream yeah, soon hours. it is almost eight o'clock for me i normally never stream this late there's just so much content so we got a ton of likes i will come back with ambience to do a part two exactly like this and finish it off as soon as we can maybe a, like in a week maybe in less than a week whenever we'll, we'll talk all right um but yeah enter the bluff turn that for after oh boy yeah uh yeah I, honestly at this point if security reach just copied uh fazbear fries it would have been better than what we got i thought that was actually a surprise thing from map but i wasn't sure about it you gotta binge fast for fights on Audible. Good luck. I've heard they're even scarier when they're just sounds. So yeah, good luck. Yeah. With that. Anyways. Um, yeah, I can imagine. I might try and reread uh, like a few. I don't know. I might try and reread like some of the later stories. Uh, I think like, some I'm just gonna reread the epilogues particularly um, because those are the ones I need refreshing on. But like, I think I can remember yeah. most of the others from the titles and images because they evoke the memories. Whereas the epilogues are just numbered. Yeah. So. Um, you might want to show both, uh, tier lists on stream also before we end it off, just so people can see yes. the finished versions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, again, this is not finished, but we will show the finished one next time. This is my tier list so far. Uh, this is just based on how much I enjoyed the stories, you know, writing, how scary it was, you know, characters, plot, horror, um, and even how they connect with each other. This is, uh, basically the same thing, but I made it an alignment chart to also sort by lore relevance. So, like, out of stock on 135M were fantastic, but not less relevant to the lore, whereas Man and Room Torvati and New Kid were 
I don't like them as much, but they were very you know, important to the lore. It's interesting to see how that dynamic works. Ignore the epilogues. I can't put them back here, so I've just shoved them somewhere. Uh, but yeah. Um, if you guys have enjoyed, it is time to sell out. <laughs> Leave a like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, share this with your friends. Sports are very much appreciated. I'm trying to reach a thousand subscribers by the end of the month. If you can help me get there, I'll do not one, but two monetization 1,000 subscriber specials. That'd be a pretty big deal. Uh, very exciting time for the channel. Uh, yeah, check out the links in the description. Go support today's charity shout out. Goes to Crisis. You go help homelessness. It's a new real issue in the UK, and I'm sure there's other charities for... I mean, they probably operate in, like, multiple countries. A lot of these things tend to be connected. Why is my mouse... My mouse is not working. Whatever. Um, check out Ambience. Obviously, his link is in the description, and he does amazing videos. Good sport for joining me today and making this amazing stream. Um, if you want to go talk to him about FNAF lore, that's great. But something which is even bigger is obviously uh, FNAF gameplay. FNAF gameplay lore. All right. Forget FNAF story lore. FNAF <laughs> gameplay lore. This guy is among the world's best and has compiled information from the world's best FNAF players into these amazing guide videos on everything from FNAF 1 up to Ultimate Custom Night, which he is currently going through right now. And, you know, he'll cover Help Wanted and fan games and all that in time. He's also doing some live streams and stuff like Jolly, making a tier list of fan games, which is really cool. You go check it out. It's awesome. All right, there's a lot of cool stuff over there. Uh, there's also social media's link in the description and today's QOTD winner, which... I don't know if anyone actually had a go at the QOTD. I don't think anyone did. Most well, I'm going to leave it out. About yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking you guys. Be, I'm going to think about that a little bit, I think, uh, myself. because that's. There will be a question. next time. I'll reuse it if no one else uh, has a go at it today. But yeah, check it all out, guys. Yeah. The tier list is obviously in the description if you want to have a go at it for yourself. But we are all done yeah, for definitely. today. Should be interesting. Uh, I've made my own tier list on this a uh, while back also. Matt helped out with that one, so uh, I'll go ahead and share that in the Hydration Nation Discord Please server. Do. If anyone yep. wants go to join, join the Discord if you want to see it. In it. Yep. Uh, hey, yep. there's my and, thumbnail. Uh, nice. Yeah, anyway, super fun time. Uh, thanks for having me on the stream, Matt. Can't wait for part two. Can't wait for the yes. Fazbear Frights timeline. Exciting. Lots of exciting stuff coming up. Dude, and, like, uh, I'm going to come yeah. back in a few months to do some, like, serious lore videos on this, and, you know, we could do that as well. There's just so much going on. It's just yeah, great. Be this very is, like, peak Five Nights at Freddy's right now. Oh, Definitely. man. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, I gotta go eat some lunch before my stream. I'll see you so, around, dude. Yeah, I'll see you around. Thanks for having me, and uh, stay hydrated, chat. Hey, yeah. All right, bye. <laughs> Have a good one. See you around. All right, fellas. Uh, as I said, everything's in the description. And that is all for today. There was one more thing I wanted to say. No, there wasn't. We're all done. We're all done, all right. There'll be a part two soon. I don't know when, but like, we're not done here. There's just so much we can't do in one stream. I'll see you soon. Stay hydrated.